I'd like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being live streamed on the Council's YouTube account and also being recorded for publication on the Council's website. I would also like to remind members and officers to mute their microphones when they're not speaking. Officers attending virtually on Microsoft Teams, please use the raise your hand option when you wish to speak and Wendy will note this down and will let me know. As this is a new membership and the first meeting, I would like the members and officers of the committee to introduce themselves. Can we start with the officers in the chamber, please? Other button. Oh, try again. Try again. Good evening, colleagues. Michelle Lucas, Assistant Director, Education and Skills. Good evening, everybody. I'm Andrea Winstone. I'm the Strategic Lead for School Effectiveness and Special Educational Needs and Disabilities. Can the um, officers and the youth cabinet on teams please introduce themselves? Yes, um, it's Sheila Murphy, I'm the Corporate Director for Children's Services. Good evening everyone, my name's Priscilla Brusanon, I'm the Business Manager for Thorough Local Safeguarding Children's Partnership. Good evening, everyone. I'm Catherine Wilson. I'm Strategic Lead for Commissioning Across Children and Adult Services. Good evening. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Ibi Alako and I'm the Vice Chair of Thorough Youth Cabinet. Good evening, good evening everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lauren Heath, the Chair of the Tharp Youth Council. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mia Danishman, and I'm the Deputy MYP of the Thorough Youth Cabinet. Hi, everyone. I'm Sosia Manwa, and I'm the Youth Parliament Member for Thorough. Thank you. Now, members in the chamber, can we start with Councillor Tandy, please? Good evening. I'm James Fandy, Councillor James Fandy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Councillor Lee Watson, West Thorock South Sipping and Perfect on Thames. Hi, Good I'm Sarah Barlow. I'm representing uh, the Church of England. Nicola Cranch, Parent Governor, Woodside Academy. Uh, Graham Snell, Councillor for Corringham and Fobbing and Vice Chair of this committee. Alex Anderson, Councillor for Stamford East and Corringham Town. Councillor Abiy Akinbaum for South Shefford. Thank you. I think I did miss a couple of names of people on team, so I might have to ask uh, you to refresh me on those. Forgive me for that. Can we move on to item one, apologies for absence? I've received no apologies. Wendy, have any apologies been received? Yes. Um, yes, Chair. Councillor Little has given her apologies and Councillor Fandy is substituting in his place. Thank you. Item two are the minutes. I move that the minutes of the Children's Services Overview and Scrutiny Committee held on the 2nd of February 2021 to be approved as a correct record. Are there any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? The minutes are approved. I've agreed to one item of urgent business, which is a verbal update on the recent Ofsted inspection. I've agreed to this because we should hear the details of the inspection and whether there were any issues identified before the official outcome in August. We will be hearing the full details in a report in October. Sheila, can you give an, a verbal update, please? I certainly can. Um, 
we had Ofsted in to do a focus visit on vulnerable children subject to extrafamilial harm. So that's children who might be missing from home, care or education, children who might be involved in some forms of exploitation, whether that's child sexual exploitation, criminal exploitation or invo involved in some kind of um, gang activity, county lines, that sort of thing. So it's it's vulnerable children at the most, the sort of highest end, really. Um, so we had a two-week period before Ofsted came in for two days. I say came in, it was virtual. Um, they looked at cases, they spoke to social workers, they spoke to managers, they spoke to partners. At the end of that, they've given us verbal feedback, but until we get anything in writing, I can't confirm what it is that they're going to be putting out in the public domain. On the whole, it was very positive in terms of what they observed, what they saw, um, how the partnership works. There was a recommendation for us in the Ofsted 2019 inspection um, around missing and CSE children, and they said they could see real improvements from the 2019 inspection. Um, as with any inspection, and it is a little bit like having free consultation come in, um, there's always areas that you can learn and improve on. Um, they gave us some feedback, but as I said, until we see the letter in writing, I'm not sure what they'll be putting um, forward for us. Um, so basically, on the whole, as I say, it's fairly positive. Can't give too much comment in terms of detail because I'm not sure what's going to be in the letter. It's not a judgment inspection, so it won't be a judgment about whether it requires improvement, good or outstanding. Um, but in terms of how they write it will indicate um, how they feel that inspection went. So the, what they basically saying to us was that we are a good authority. We continue to be a good authority. Thank you. Are, are there any questions for Sheila? Sheila, just one from me. Were, were there any areas, um, obviously it's, it's good to hear that um, the area of, of recommendation on the last Ofsted report that they said that, that you were doing well on that. Were there any areas that might be areas for improvement? I think there will be some areas for improvement. Um, I'm just trying to think from their feedback. So, so one of the areas they were looking at was return home interviews. That we do those 100, we refer those 100, percent and some young people choose not to take them up. So they were saying, what more can you do for the young people who maybe are most disaffected to take up the offer of some of those um, return home interviews um, but overall the practice in that area is good but it is about what more can we do uh, there were some issues around um, placements for post 18 year olds and in fact there was a paper on the agenda this evening about that it's about about having particularly for those young people that are subject to extra familial harm um, so those are the sort of areas that they raised with us. I say until we see it in writing, it's difficult to know exactly what they're going to put forward for us. But as I say, it, it, their feedback to us was whatever they're putting forward, it's coming from a base of being good and trying to improve what we're already doing. That's good. So hopefully we're on a course from being good to being outstanding. Thank you, Sheila. Item four. Declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations of interest to make? Sarah? Do I need to say, uh, so I'm representing the Church of England, but I work in a Thurrock school and I have children that attend Thurrock schools. I think, that, I, I think that's a fair declaration to make. I don't think it's a pecuniary interest, but thank you, yes. We'll move on to item five, and this is a verbal update from the Youth Cabinet. Can I ask the Youth Cabinet to provide an update, please? Hi, uh, um, my name's Lauren Hooper, and I'm the uh, um, chair of the Farrock Youth Cabinet. 
Um, this year we have had the new vice chair, chair MYP and D DM MYP introduced. So these are all of the new ones online. Um, this year the youth cabinet have been working hard, coming together and still projecting the voices of young people. We have been attending meetings virtually and some face now. And um and to ensure people, uh, young people's views are still heard. And we have created multiple projects that we'll be talking about further down the line that we are continuously working on. Um, I'm now going to pass it over to CC, who's our MYP, about the topics for the British Youth Council. Um, hi, guys, I'm CC, and I'm going to be giving an update on my work as the MYP for Thorough. So we have members of the Youth Cabinet attending every BYC meeting, including Mina, our DMYP. And from this, we listen to the main concerns that are raised and use them towards our project. So at the last BYC uh, meeting, the main topics that were brought up were climate change, making higher education more accessible for young people and young people's mental health. And from this engaging meeting, there are members taking lots of like different views and relating them to our projects. So we can see this from our mental health projects, which we're focusing on with the services that are currently on offer for young people and the plastic pollution campaign we're currently running, which we had a meeting on yesterday. I'm now going to pass on to our DMYP, Mina, who can go through our campaigns that we're running this year. So one of the campaigns that we are currently running is the Boom Project, and we did that during the second lockdown, I believe. So members of the Youth Council and the young members of Thurrock were invited to take part in a project that encouraged us to explore imagination and creativity and gave us the tools to explore and try new things. So the object objectives of this programme was to explore young people's views on physical and mental health as part of the Brighter Future strategy. In this project, we worked in groups and you could see every young person taking parts had begun to grow throughout of it. And we focused on three main areas, writing, drawing and music in order to express new ways uh, we can explore ourselves. So in total, 29 young people and four youth cabinet members participated in this project. At the end of this project, the team worked on putting a video together demonstrating all the work the young people had completed within this week. The video depicted everyone's work and portrayed a real message straight from the young people. In August, we are seeing this um, this final uh, film and we'll be meeting each other face to face which will be a good route to the project. I'm now going to pass it over to Ibi who is the vice. Oh, hello, um, so I'm the vice chair and um, I'm just going to tell you about the common, the common topics that we're focusing on. So the first one is mental health and we are working with the mental health service to complete a survey to gather information on young people's thoughts on the mental health services available. The second one is plastic pollution. And this is where we are putting together a campaign and ideas on how we can create a change, i.e. more recyclable bins. And the last one is gangs, county lines and grooming, creating awareness videos that young people will take in and information through these videos based on key topics. So I'm going to pass it on to Lauren and she's going to talk about police partnership. Hi, so um, for the police partnership, the aim of this partnership with the police is to start building a stronger and positive relationship between young people and the police. This will over support both young people and the police and benefit the community as a whole. In order to activate this partnership, Essex Police invited the chair and vice chair, chair of the youth committee down to the police station where we had a meeting with police officers from different specialist areas. The main points raised that both parties want to work on improving are the following. One of the main aims was to improve Essex Police social media to ensure young people are active in reading important information. The second one is for the police to engage with young people from a young age to build a positive relationship. The third one is we are going to produce a short an informative YouTube clip for young people to watch aimed for them on topics that young people want to know about, such as gangs, knife crime, using social media platform to engage them. Um, the next one is using other forms of social media to reach young people's attention. Then an event where young people can attend and see different areas of policing and able to interact with the police officers. The youth cabinet are working continuously with Exit Police to ensure that we can maintain this partnership and put in place what we have discussed and we can see re-engaging with this 
as police officer attends our monthly meetings to give us community updates and we can raise any concerns and work on our partnership from there. So as a whole, the youth cabinet are continuously working hard and adapting the projects to get the best outcome for young people. We listen to people's views and whilst creating partnerships in order to engage all members of the community who support young people's views and voices. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you very much from the Youth Cabinet. It's always a pleasure to hear from the Youth Cabinet and welcome to a new Youth Cabinet this year. Um, we look forward to hear your reports throughout the year. That was a packed report already. Uh, well done on all of that. Uh, I'll throw it open to members now. Is there any questions? Yes, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a brief comment from uh, myself. Um, I really commend the inclusion of um, uh, grooming and, and um, issues surrounding gangs and county lines uh, in your focus um, for, for the upcoming year. Um, this is uh, uh, an issue that I'm particularly interested in um, and it's fantastic to hear that, that you're going to be looking at that as well. Um, and then just to say, Chair, like you did welcome uh, long-standing members of this committee obviously will, um, uh, will have engaged with the previous Youth Cabinet. Their um, updates were always valued it's fantastic to, to have you here and uh, I know yours will be uh, be valued as well. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Would anybody else like to ask questions? Okay. Uh, from me, they sound like a terrific uh, range of product pro uh, projects that you've got going there. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're working on various bits of social media, dragging us all into the... <laughs> 21st century um, and I particularly like that you're doing a campaign on plastic pollution this is such a, a massive problem at the moment um, is there anything that you would like to ask from us as members of the committee that could be helpful to you throughout the year um, well I think we had put a letter together to send to I think it was yourself um, just about kind of what we want to do. We set out five main things that we want to do, like introducing new recycling bins, getting competitions going within schools. So if we could work with you, that would be great. And um, the second thing is we'd like um, to try and get the youth cabinet social media back so we can kind of project what we're doing to engage more young people. Yeah, I'll certainly be happy to help you out with those things. I don't think I've received a letter as yet. When do you? All right, okay. But it's, it's something that you're putting together, maybe. Yeah. yeah, we've just put it together. Thank you. Brilliant. I look forward to receiving that. Thank you very much. Of course, um, you can stay for the rest of the meeting if you wish, but if you, if you wish to go, you can. Um, that's up to you, but we'll be happy to have you here for the rest of the meeting if you want to stay. Sorry, Sheila, you've got your hand up. I think you're on mute. Yeah, so I've put my hand down first. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that, for you, Councillor. That was really brilliant. I'm really pleased to hear about the work you're doing with the police on sort of gangs, county lives, knife crime. And, and anything that you think we can do to support with that, or if there's any wider groups of young people, children that you want us to get involved with that, we can certainly put you in touch. So I think it's a really amazing piece of work and certainly would like to know more about that. And I'm sure you'll be telling us more as, as we go on. So that was really interesting to hear about. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. So no recommendations to approve. So can we move on to item six, update on the LSCP peer review action plan? Can I ask Priscilla, Bruce and Anne to present, please? Um, good evening, uh, Mal, Doni, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. I've presented my written report and updated action plan on the peer review. The peer review, for just a little bit of background, was commissioned by the LSCP um, in August uh, earlier of last year and was published in August last year prior to me joining the LSCP. I joined the LSCP in October last year and took um, um, the, the lead on the action plan for the peer review. Um, as you can see, I'm pleased to say that much and many of the um, actions and the recommendations 
on the updated action plan are now either blue or green. And I believe that action two or recommendation two, which refers to the multi-agency safeguarding hub, um, that is green on your copy. I can now say that that is now blue because um, the MASH um, subgroup is now part of the LSCP structure and is now embedded. There have been two meetings which have been which have fed into the LSCP governance structure and that seems to be working really well so far. Um, this is an evolving action plan. Um, and so what we've got here is, um, as I say, many of the um, recommendations are now blue or green. And of the ones that are amber, they're the ones that we need to do a little bit more work on to make sure that they're right. Um, the first one, which is recommendation three, which refers to a production of a priorities outcome document, which is shared across the LSCP, the Safeguarding Adults Board, the Community Safety Partnership and the Health and Wellbeing Board is actually being devised and is being put together as we speak. So the date, um, the time scale for completion is the 31st of July. It will be done in that time. And if, it, if, if there is a little bit more movement on there, it means that it needs to go through to the governance structures in those other boards to be signed off. So the document has been devised and it's put together. It just needs to go to the right governance structures in those later dates in the autumn term to be signed off. And so I'm not worried about that um, action being amber. The action underneath that that talks about a protocol to reduce duplication is in the same position that um, draft protocol is in place and it's been shared across all the other boards um, to just have their comments and to make sure that they're happy with that protocol going forward. So again, I'm not um, concerned about that action, although we've missed the, the time scale originally put in place for the 31st of March. We are still progressing. It will still be completed. I'm not worried about it not being completed. It will be. Um, from five down, those actions are green. You'll see that we've put we've we've met all of those recommendations and the actions to meet those recommendations. Um, the next action that is amber on that action plan is talks about um, induction packs and training and resources for the partners. So this is to, across the partnership through health, Essex Police, and Chil and the local authority. We're fully on track to launch um, that. Um, action. We're launching the information there along with our newly refreshed um, LSCP website in the autumn term and on that website will be hosted a learning hub which will showcase um, some seven minute videos, some seven minute learning briefings and some bite sized pieces of training and learning for um, the whole partnership and colleagues within the partnership. So that is being devised and work is, is continuing with that um, recommendation. You'll see the next two are green um, and then it was I'm pleased pleased to hear from the new youth cabinet this evening talking about all the work that they're doing especially the work on gangs and youth violence and one of the actions on there that is still amber is to work with existing structures in schools the youth cabinet and the um the um, youth council and the care commission to work through how we can work as a lscp in terms of feeding through into those existing structures, how they can work with us and in terms of what they would like to see us doing in terms of the information that we can share and cascade with them. So one of the things that I'll be taking away from this meeting is the names of the new youth cabinet members and engaging with them along with their um, leads in their areas to find out what work that we can do ongoing. At the moment, we've got some engagement activities that we are collaborating with in terms of the um, youth participation officer that sits within the children's social care. And we're using that opportunity um, to do some engagement activities with some of the children in these areas. Um, at the Grange Waters um, Outdoor Activity Centre and that's taking place at the end of this month. So that's kickstarting some of the work that we're doing to engage children and young people in our community. Um, um, recommendation 23 links into the Action 22 and talks, talking about um, questionnaires and asking the youth and the young people how 
the work that we do influences them and how they can um, feed their views and opinions into the work of the LSCP. So those two um, actions will be achieved side by side or simultaneously at the same time, but it doesn't stop there. And we will continue to work through and to engage with young people via the existing structures and possibly um, develop some more uh, new um, groups going forward. In terms of 24, um, we have devised a job description and an information leaflet on um, some some work that a, a lay member can work alongside us with. Um, we've not been success, successful in recruiting a lay member, but what we have done is shared this information with the Governor Services team and hoping that we can be able to um, reach out to people that are in the govern, who are governors of schools and academies at the moment that might like to do some work with us. And so that's where we are with that. We are going to push on with that and maybe look at new and different ways to recruit lay members into the LSCP structure. In terms of Action 25, work with specific faith and community groups, a lot of the work that we've had, we've been able to do has been through Essex Police, as we say, but we want to do some more work with the um, community groups and the local um, faith groups directly in terms of going out and doing engagement and outreach work, um, attending meetings and feeding in the work that we do in terms of safeguarding in the community, raising the awareness of safeguarding in the community and having that um, 360 feedback. So what is it about um, faith groups and community groups that they would like to see from the, from the um, partnership and how we can cascade more information, training and sharing resources that raises awareness of safeguarding in the community via those um, groups. Um, and just to say, although um, action, recommendation 26 is green, there is a further update because this report, this um, action plan was prepared ahead of time. I'm pleased to say that Nikki Pace has been recruited as the interim chair and scrutineer for the LSCP. However, um, we held some interviews at the beginning of this month and we have recruited a permanent full-time independent chair scrutineer that will take over from Nikki when she leaves the post in September. But I can update more on that when the person comes into post. We're still going through recruitment, a process, um, sorry, recruit, yeah, recruitment um, checks for that person. Um, that's for me, unless any questions. Thanks, Priscilla. Are there any questions? Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask a quick question? When originally this plan was put in place, what was your actual timeline to complete? Uh, we, we did well, we didn't have an overall timeline for the whole action plan because we had various different um, timescales for it, but we were hoping that we would at least achieve everything and have all of the items green by the end of this one, this um, calendar year. Okay, so sorry. So in terms of the March one that is now slipped slightly, so when are you looking at this will in, you know, I know there's different elements, but when do you think this will be completed, these elements that the, this whole plan will be completed by in terms of your project? Or your the whole action plan. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, well, I'm confident that the action plan will be completed by the end of this calendar year. December. Yeah. Yes. Yes. December 2021. Right. And you're confident that it is actually on time to deliver that. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, we've we've done quite a bit of work on there. As you'll see, there were 26 recommendations, and of the 26, there are only a handful that are amber, and those that are amber have ongoing work in the in the background, and so it's it's edging towards the end of it anyway and a lot of those outstanding parts of it are because they need to go through various other governance structures in other um, partnerships and that's what's given yeah. the time so i would say that some of these um time scales were a little bit ambitious at the time that we put them in so a, a bit more time if if i'd looked at it probably in a bit more detail when i first started i probably would have asked for some more time on some of them but that we are where we are but i am confident that these will be achieved by the end of the calendar year. Okay, thank you. Councillor Snell. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for your report. Um, I want to refer to um, item 26 on the, um, the list here, where we're talking about um, taking on a permanent position for the uh, independent chair and scrutineer. I'm assuming that's a paid position. So in, in which way is that 
independent place? So we pay the person, They, it is a paid position, you're right, but we have to pay for that person's expertise and specialism. They are not um, directly employed in terms of that they don't have a vested interest, they're not employed directly into the local authority, they're, di they're employed by the partnership, which means that they represent all three strategic partners and relevant agencies, and that person is there purely to provide um, independent scrutiny to look at what, what structures are in place and to make sure that we are working efficiently and to, to pick out areas of improvement and development and to help us to, um, to, to push forward in the areas that we're doing quite well. But you are right, it is a paid position, but that person is independent. Uh, yeah, so is, is that person in, um, in the employ of Thurrock Council in effect? Yes, because the, um, the the business team is hosted within the local authority, but the, the, the business team is led by all three strategic partners and relevant agencies. So equally, Essex Police, the local authority and Thurrock CCG are the people that um, that, we, that we work to. We don't work just purely and simply just for one area. It's across the partnership that we work for. But because the business team and the LSCP is hosted within the local authority, that's why we're employed that way. Yeah, thank you for that. Now, I, I just have a, it's, it's a minor concern, I suppose, but it, it just seems to me that all this good work is going on because we've had a peer review, which is people coming in from outside to have a look at what we're doing and um, suggest improvements which we take on board and, and run with. Um, I, I just feel that if you, you then embed someone within the council, that it, it over time becomes less independent and actually what, what you do need sometimes is rather than the same person looking over the same stuff in effect, is a fresh set of eyes every now and again. So I, I, I'm not really sure where I see there's a major benefit to that. I, I hear what you're saying and you're right. However, this post that we've recruited to, so the p first person that's recruited is interim and she's been doing that work since May and she will continue till September. This post will be refreshed after three years. So the person that we recruit from um, September will be in post for three, for three um, years but their um, brief is very strict. They're, they're, it's about improvement and it's about independent scrutiny and looking at it from outside of the, the, um, the partnership, if you like, and looking at what's working, what's not working, looking at emerging themes and benchmarking across to other safeguarding partnerships as well and looking at where we can improve. So I do take your point, but that person will be um, independent and come with fresh eyes. And every three years, we'll get an injection of, of fresh eyes. I suppose I've got to ask this question, really. So the, 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 the peer review that has just been conducted, did we pay for that at all? Uh, yes, we did have to pay for it. OK, that's all. Thank you. You're welcome. Sheila, did you want to come in on that? Uh, yes, please. Um, in, in terms of independence, so they are independent from all of the partners and the agencies, so they're not involved in any operational or strategic involvement. So, so although this person comes with a lot of experience in this area of work, they have no input into any of the partners in terms of how we work, how we operate. So that's their independence really, is they, they, are, they are totally offline from all the partners in terms of how we operate, how the services are delivered, and that's where they get their independence from. Thank you. Do you want to come back? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I, I thank you for that answer. I, I, I do get that, and actually what I was concerned about mostly was that if it's the same set of eyes looking at the same issues for a long period of time, then complacency sets in. But the previous answer of where that role is going to be changed every three years or so um, actually deals with that, uh, that issue. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Uh, I just wanted to say from myself, Priscilla, obviously looking at the progress that's been made since the, the, you brought the report before, um, there's been great progress. I mean, obviously we understand that sometimes um, things can't get signed off as quickly, when, especially when you're dealing with quite a complex system with three different organisations and a lot of governance process to go through. But I mean, all the actions that were showing red last time, two of them are now green. 
two of them are, are amber, so there's been there's been movement there. Most of the rest of the actions on there last time were, were on amber, and a significant amount of those have moved through to green. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge your hard work on this, and uh, it does feel like this is this is moving forward well. So thank you for that. Thank you, Tim. Uh, can we move to recommendation 1.1 on page 17 to agree? Agreed, thank you. Next item is item 7, the SEND Education and Residential Placements. Can I ask Catherine Wilson, please, to introduce the report? Thank you, Chair. I think Michelle is going to introduce um, the report just to give an overview and then I will do the commissioning aspect of this one. OK, thank you, Catherine. Michelle? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this report is um, presenting uh, around how we're going to go forward on SEND residential placements. This forms part of actually our written statement of action. So if people cross-reference against our written statement of action, you can see that this report links to that. What I wanted to say, colleagues, was actually um, having recently commissioned quite an in-depth review of where we are in Thurrock around placements, we actually um, are one of the lower um, authorities to send children outside the authority. We work really hard to keep our children in the local authority, offering them a range of um, provision at local level. I think this report um, needs to go to ONS and it goes on to Cabinet for approval. And it's looking at how we want to go out and commission further um, local provision for our children with um, SEND. So it links to our written statement of action. So uh, those that can cross-reference against that, that would be um, really helpful. I think just to say, um, I'm very conscious that we've seen a significant increase in the number of children who are coming to us with very complex um, SEND um, challenges. So there will always be some children or young people that we have to look for external placements. It's a really challenging market. Catherine will do a little bit with you around the challenges around the market. Um, actually, too few places and too many children. So what we're looking to do is go out on a commissioning framework that gives us opportunities uh, to get those placements uh, when we need them. So, Catherine, I'll hand over to you to talk about the commissioning process, please. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yes, as Michelle says, it is a very challenging market. We have um, uh, an oversubscription of the need for um, placements for young people. Um, and so our providers um, in that kind of market feel that they can um, charge us anything that they want to. Um, and that creates a lot of difficulties. And so... The commissioning approach is to create a, an approved provider list, which means that we will create a framework where we will invite providers to um, uh, bid to be part of that framework. And we will have expectations within that framework um, around uh, quality, outcomes for young people, preparation for adulthood and independence, um, policies and procedures, and also value for money. And we will be very clear about the expectations that Thurrock have um, for the young people who do need to go out of, of Borough. Um, and that will be monitored very closely by our commissioning team once this framework um, is in place. Um, so currently the specification is um, being written in preparation and obviously understanding that this needs to be approved and go forward to Cabinet for that approval. But we're preparing as we feel that this is a a really important um, piece of work to enable us to have far more control over our market. Um, and we've done a, a detailed piece of work, as Michelle says, to look at what that need is. Um, and we will now move forward with commissioning that and um, establishing that provider list in the form of the framework. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just just one for me first before we move out to the wider group. Um, have we considered 
um because obviously we've got we've got our treetops provision we've got some really good um provision in the local area have we considered instead of going to the market for these services actually providing some of these services ourselves Shall I take that one, Catherine? Sorry, she's looking. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's fine. So actually, the report sets out some local provision that we want to commission as well, uh, Chair. So we're looking to commission some more primary um, autism uh, bases. We're also looking to um, think about what we need for uh, SEMH at secondary. So the, the, the report identifies a range of things we want to commission at a local level, because you're quite right, we've got a number of things in place locally that are working well. What this paper does is it, it asks permission for us to do that, as well as look at those external um, residential placements. In the main colleagues, they're residential. Uh, which we cannot um, accommodate um, locally. So um, that's so it's two parts really: local provision, which is what we're looking to do, as well as the residential um, provision, which we know is incredibly um, high cost, and it does it really is for some of our most complex children and young people with SCND. So I hope that clarifies that. Thank you, Michelle. Are there any questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, I noted, Michelle, that um, in your presentation of the report, you did mention that um, uh, we're quite good as a borough for uh, keeping our children in the borough, which is fantastic to hear when compared to neighbours, etc. Um, in, in the report on page 52, um, 17.5.1, it, it mentions that there are 204 uh, children and young people that do access uh, provision outside of the borough. So we're, we're better than our sort of statistical neighbours, but I was just wondering if you could give an idea of what that trend is compared to us over the past five, ten years, or if you have an idea about that. Are, are we, although we're better than statistical neighbours, are we uh, going up in terms of uh, the number of children we, we're sending outside the borough, or are we going down, staying around the same? So that's a really good question and the difficulty is we are seeing more and more highly complex children and young people. Actually I met with the Education Skills Funding Agency today and we went through our management plan and clearly SEND spend is one of those things that we're actually looking at and what I challenged colleagues at the SFA to think about was the national picture around finding these types of provisions for very complex um, sort of children and young people. So to answer your question, my feeling is it's remained pretty static. However, at any given time that can change. Um, you know, if parents do not feel they're getting what they need at a local level and we can't meet their needs, particularly when you're getting to the high level complex residential placements, then the likelihood is we may see an increase in that. We're trying to manage that um, because clearly what we want to do is keep young people local. But sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes we need to find residential placement for some of our most complex cases. But the report that I sort of talked about at the start when I opened this report actually says Thurrock is a very inclusive borough. And I think we should all be very proud of that. We've worked hard with our schools. The partnership with our schools is strong. The report says we're an inclusive borough, so we're doing our best to keep as many as our children and young people local as we possibly can. Thank you. Nicola. Um, do we have any sort of idea of how many children are waiting for EHEPs? and how, how long it takes from start to finish, because these are the three ones that we've got them, but obviously I'm sure through the pandemic we've got quite a surge coming up, and it's just something, I mean, I'm not expecting it off an exact number, but just some sort of rough idea would be good, thank you. Very fortunately, I've got one of my service managers who will absolutely be able to answer that. So. I Hi, Nicola. Um, yes, at the moment we've got 135 EHCPs in process. Uh, they take 20 weeks from beginning to end. Um, that's a statutory time scale. Uh, last month we had, I think it was 83% on time. Uh, this month we've got none, none that are late at the moment. We are very heavily monitored on it. Uh, I know my numbers because I, um, I go to the board with them every month. So, yes, there is a... There is a there isn't a waiting list for an EHCP, but there is a wait time from, from request to, 
to publication. Um, we last year uh, we were at eighty six percent on time, which was in the top twenty percent in the country, um, against a national figure of sixty percent. And lastly, how many roughly do we close at? Because I'm sure two of them do actually come to the end of a term where they don't need any. So let's not all have all negative. Let's have some positive too, please. Children and young people tend to have their plans ceased when they finish education um, because the plan is around them accessing education. Um, we currently, last year we closed uh, approximately 100 plans as the children were leaving full-time education and going either to the workplace or are no longer needing a plan to access education. Sally. Andrea, are you going to take that one? Um, yeah. um, okay, so we uh, there's a, a two-stage process. So there's a, a, um, a request to assess, and then there's once we've assessed, we decide whether we'll issue a plan or not. So there's two different figures there that we could be looking at. The request to assess is very few because we, we assess and then decide whether we should issue a plan rather than just say no to assess. Um, the figure for not issuing, where we don't think the, the child needs a plan because they can be met through SEN support in school, is approximately 25%. And how many of those does the school or the department mm -hmm. of education? Sorry, how many of those go to a school? Sally, I don't. It's the right hand button. No, sorry. Yeah, that's right. yeah, that's part of so how many of those go through to appeal or go on to a tribunal if the um, if the plan doesn't go through, it's not approved? Again, very few, a very small percentage. Um, I haven't got the figures with me, but I'm quite happy to prepare those um, and send them on to Wendy to share with you. But it's it's under five percent. Are there any other questions, councillor? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report. It's really informative. So can I ask a couple of questions, please? So on 3.3, um, you source provision within close to the borough of currently 74% of placements are within 20 miles. So that means 26% is actually in our borough. Is that correct? And um, out of those 74% is within 20 miles, is how many of that percentage is actually 20 miles and then comes closer? Have you got that sort of data, that would be really good to know. Michelle, I don't think you're... Um, oh, sorry. Pardon, sorry, it's like the mute button. Uh, apologies. Um, we haven't got that data with us, but if you'd like that, we can make sure that we can get that sent round. I can email it to Wendy so that you can see it. Yeah, that okay. perfect. that's fine. Thanks. Can I ask one other question? So the other question I want to know is, as I'm... I'm new member, and um, I just wanted to know, on on one of your recommendations, it said expansion in post-16 provision, but then it says, um, in particular reference, with the work at Grangewater, our outdoor education centre, as provided. So what provision has been provided by Grangewater? Thank so, you. So when we had our initial inspection, what, what it... What it clearly stated to us was that our post-16 cohort was saying, actually, they didn't find what they were, do what they were currently doing. Uh, very challenging, very exciting. And one of the terminologies they used was they were quite bored. So what we said, right, OK, let's meet with you. What would you like to do? Using outdoor education is a really powerful tool for all young people, but particularly for SEND. So what we've developed is a range of programmes where they do some sort of class-based work, they go over to Grangewaters and do some outdoor activities work, all part of their learning package. Um, and actually, the feedback from those programmes have been very, very positive. If you look on our newly refreshed local offer, you'll see some videos of our young people who are actually there doing the programmes and are very excited about it. And we've videoed it so that people can see what's actually happening. Thank you. Also, um, in, in, a da in a week... How often do you use that provision down at Grange Water? Because it sounds really good. So for SCND, it's used twice a week. Um, and it's used by other um, schools and, and at, uh, AP providers as well. So it's got quite a range of uh, children and young people who access it. But for SCND, it's twice a week. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Councillor Akin Bowen. Thank you, Chair. I just want to have, ask a quick question. Uh, if a child is required to go outside the borough, how quickly do they get offered a placement? That's a really good question. It's really challenging. So we can do a whole range of consultation exercises to get a place, councillor. But there's a number of things that need to be considered. Does, does the child meet the, meet the profile of that school? Can they offer what that child needs? Have they got availability? Is there space uh, in the school? So it's difficult to say it takes this amount of weeks because every indiv individual case is, is different. However, we do have some challenges with some of our more complex um, students. But to give a bit of reassurance, they're still getting some form of education. So we're putting tuition in. Our, our children and young people are getting education, but sometimes some of our consultations for SCND uh, provision um, outside the local authority is really, really challenging. It's a, chal it's a challenge for all local authorities at the moment. As I said, there are too few places for the numbers of children that are coming through. Thank you. Councillor Watson. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. So just one more question. So um, who decides on where that child is placed? Like what criteria? How does that, how does that work? Thank you. So it's very much a partnership. It's very much a partnership. So, so if I give you an example, if there's a child currently in mainstream school and the school feel that actually they're unable to meet that child's needs, they will have a discussion with the parent. The parent will think about what that looks like for their child, again, the partnership. It will then come into the SEND team. Uh, we've got something called a panel. And actually, I met with parents yesterday and talked about the panel. So I went through all the stages of the panel for, to a number of parents. It comes to the panel and the panel look at it and they say, do you know what? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the school's tried everything it can try. We do think it needs to be, um, you know, an external placement. So it's very much a partnership, very much a partnership. Always putting the child or the young person at the centre of it. Always thinking about what's best for that child or that young person. So it's that partnership approach. So it's, it's not one decision maker. There's a number of decision makers in relation to that. Does that help? Yeah. Councillor Snell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, the report is really good. And, and to be fair, I've, I've read through it all and completely endorse that the actions that you want to take to try and secure the provision for, for children going forward and also make sure that we know exactly what we're doing when we're doing it, which is great. And I, I have to say, I was stunned to see how many children we've got in Thurrock. I mean, you, when you go around the place, you know there's a lot, but you know we're, we're con considerably higher than a national average. I mean, to me, 59,424 children, that's a lot of children. Um, and, you know, as I say, I really agree completely where we're trying to go. One of the things I, I, I know is, is an issue with, with uh, SEND um, places is that they're often uh, taken from kids that come from outside the borough. Uh, I was wondering to, to what if um, to, to what uh, level that impacts our provision in Thurrock, um, I mean, do, do we have an idea of how many children are coming in to use our provision from outside the borough at all? So we can certainly get you that data. Um, interestingly, actually, um, I was talking to some colleagues around that um, recently. I think the, the issue for us is that we've got two outstanding special schools. So on any given week, we will get at least three parents ring us to say, we're moving to Thurrock, we've put our house on the market, we're coming to Thurrock, we want to go to treetops, that's where we want to be. And what we have to say at that stage is, we'd welcome you to Thurrock, however, we need to make you aware that there is um, you know, a, a, a referral list for treetops. There's, again, um, a number of children wanting um, too few places, actually. And even with the new treetops too, as it's fondly called, we could fill that three times over. That, that's the level um, of demand. So in the main, if parents outside the local authority think that treetops is right for their child, they need to go through a process which includes tribunal. If the tribunal agree with the parent and say, yes, we think that's the right school for your child, then the school has to take 
that child because that's a legal requirement that's gone through the legal process. So it's a quite a complex um, sort of area. And, and of course, the challenge for us is that we send some of our young people to schools outside the local authority. So it is a real challenge, as I said, and, and a difficult one to address because of the high level of, of need that we're seeing uh, and not enough places. Yeah, thank you for that answer. And, and I, I tend to agree that actually in some ways it, it's kind of a compliment because if, if our schools are as excellent as they are, it's no real surprise that people want to come to them. But it, it just sort of highlights even more the need to progress, as this report suggests, to, to make sure we can firm up our placements outside the borough. Um, you know, because as I say, it, it's, it's got to add pressures. And it, it seems crazy sometimes that you know, we happen to spend money to send children outside the borough when the provision would otherwise exist within the borough, but for children coming from outside. But I do understand the problems. Thank you. Councillor Tandy. Hiya. Yeah. Um, do you have a problem? Obviously, tree tops, is, is it basic one-on-one -on -one teaching and education? Do you have a problem with the teachers? So, no, recruitment to uh, outstanding schools uh, is, is, is easier, clearly, if you've got an outstanding school. I don't think it's so much recruitment of staff. I think it's just the numbers, councillor. It literally is. There are so many children um, wanting to go to treetops. You know, it's, it's retained its outstanding uh, um, for a couple of times now through Ofsted. That's not easy to retain outstanding, I have to say. And all credit to both of our special schools, both treetops and Beacon Hill have remained at outstanding, which is, is really, really credit to them for enabling to stay at that outstanding level. But as Councillor Snell said, what that brings is people really, really wanting to get their child um, into the school. The school's got a really good training programme, so it develops its own um, sort of uh, staff within its system. So that's really positive. And as I said, the same for Beacon Hill, to be honest. Um, you know, again, an outstanding special school. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for uh, your report. Um, out of borough placements are very expensive. It's a big problem for us, obviously, and it's a big problem for lots of local authorities. Um, so absolutely, it's sensible to look for ways to um, address this issue and to be able to provide high quality placements, but to have some, some framework in place which will allow placements to happen more quickly and also for them to be better value for money. Um, for us. The thing that's really been highlighted for me in this report, just before we move on to the recommendations, is that um, both on page 28 under the SEN place capacity, um, you, the report proposes an expansion in the post-16 provision um, to support access to education, employment and training, and makes particular reference to the work that Grange Waters has provided and obviously we've heard from you Michelle that um, our SEN children go there twice a week and this was part of the development of the program which made it really sparkle for our SEN children and actually gave them that bit of joy and took it from boredom to something that was actually really really valuable um, and obviously in the commissioning priorities on page 59 there, there again, the priorities are expansion in post-16 provision. Um, what I don't understand is why the Cabinet have decided that Grange Waters is actually surplus to our requirements, um, when this report clearly indicates that it's part of what makes our require, you know, it's part of what makes our provision, it's part of our commissioning priorities moving forward. And I'd like to propose. Um, as well as agreeing 1.1 and 1.2 in recommendations that Cabinet, we also um, propose a third recommendation, 1.3, that Cabinet review their decision to declare Grange Waters surplus to requirements and look at how further, how further use can be made of, of that in order to meet the objectives in this report. Is that okay, Wendy? 
So if we can move to the recommendations, um, can we agree 1.1, 1 1.2 1 and 1.3? Thank you. Agreed. Thank you, Wendy. Excuse, excuse me, Chair. Um, yeah, sorry, I should have spoken before. I, I will agree 1.1 1 .1 and 1 1.2, but I won't agree 1.3. Um, Chair, I, I also um, didn't indicate that, that I agreed when you went through them on bulk. Um, I, I agree 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2. Okay. Um, okay. What I'll minute down is that Councillor Anderson and Councillor Snell does not agree with recommendations 1.3. And if any other members are also um, not in agreement with that, they'll just need to highlight that. Thank you, Wendy. Any other members not in agreement with that recommendation? Okay. Let's move on to item eight, supported accommodation for 18 to 24 year olds. Um, can I ask Catherine Wilson? You're gonna take this one, aren't you Catherine? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so my report sets out a proposal to commission further supported accommodation to um, give support to our vulnerable young people aged 18 to 24, but also consideration for young people 16 to 18 including our care leavers and providing a range of opportunities to support transition into adulthood. We have established a working group, which is a partnership approach across, across children, adults, housing and public health to look at accommodation support more generally. And part of that work is what is proposed in this paper. So as you will be aware, the current accommodation offer is through Head Start Housing, working very closely with our children's services, leaving an aftercare team. And we currently have a shortage of accommodation for our care leavers and young people, particularly those with additional needs and complexities relating to mental ill health and emotional well-being. And often, as we've, we've indicated in our previous report, um, some young people have to be placed outside borough. For a very small number of cases, this is in their best interest, that the vast majority of young people benefit, of course, from being in their local communities. So we're proposing to put together um, a framework um, contract that will encourage a wider range of providers who um, offer supported accommodation post-18 to bring their um, provision into Thurrock and create provision in Thurrock. We'll also want to build into that contract the ability for providers to offer support to young people who are 16 to 18 and then be able to move into accommodation at 18. The framework itself can include individual accommodation, but also can offer a block purchase to supporters in placing particularly challenging young people. And um, we've got many examples of having block placements in um, adult services, which work very well. Um, and we offer different types. We can offer different types of accommodation and different levels of support. And that's what we'll be wanting to build into the framework so that we can support our young people in their transition and preparation for adulthood. Our children looked after and care leave a sufficiency strategy has identified this need to focus on developing our offer for care leavers very much as a priority and that transition to independence. And as I said, we do have a shortfall in our post 18 provision, particularly for 24-7 um, support accommodation for young people with lower levels of need but also um, for young people with medium and high levels of need. We have a shortage of CQC registered accommodation as well, together with floating support that can be provided to young people in their own accommodation. Um, so we at the moment um, spot purchase much of this accommodation and we want to be able to add to the provision that we already have. So this will improve the offer that we have and develop that offer of support, um, supporting our young people to um, prepare for adulthood. Um, we are proposing to develop this framework as quickly as possible and um, to do that in partnership with um, the other directorates. Um, and of course, this is subject to um, uh, cabinet approval. Um, and I think 
that's just introducing the course. If anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you, Catherine. Are there any questions? Um, I've got a quick question. <laughs> I can't see anybody with any questions. Um, can you give us an example of how block purchasing could meet a young person's need and also um, sort of improve value for money? Certainly. I mean, the, the framework itself will have two elements to it. One where we would individually purchase um, provision from a provider, but also where we might go to a provider and say we would like six or ten units of accommodation and we'd like to purchase those from the provider. They would um, build or, or um, refurbish and, and, and develop something for us. We would then work with the provider um, to establish a price for all of those blocks of um, accommodation. And then we would be able to place young people in the accommodation um, more quickly, um, because obviously that provision would be there. And we would have an expectation that would, there would be um, support immediately available for a young person. So actually doing it on scale rather than individually gives us an opportunity to negotiate a slightly lower price with our providers. Thank you, Catherine. Can I ask, um, have we uh, considered sort of investing in our own housing to provide for our young people as they leave care? And um, one of the things that we are doing is is looking at what might be available in borough. And that's why we have um, our housing directorate as part of this partnership approach to see whether or not there is um, anything that we could utilise individual houses, for instance, or flats. Um, and that's something that we're certainly exploring as part of the commissioning strategy and the development of the framework. Would that be from current council stock? It might well be, but it also might be a new build that's being developed by um, developers within Zurich. Right, so that would be by buying in provision. Because um, presumably we could we could actually get better value for money if we were uh, if we were owning the property and that would be an income stream for for the council. So I just wondered if that was part of the strategy because I couldn't really see that in the report. It's not in the report, but it is something that we are considering um, whether or not um, we could um, utilise something like that, and that's why we're working with housing around. Something I want to say is called right to buy, but it isn't that. It's something else, um, which means that we can utilise properties. But I can find out what that is and circulate that to members. Can I, can I mean, you... obviously, we have got quite a pressing housing need just in the in the general population. So um, I, I, I don't know if I'd want to uh, say from ca current housing stock, but I mean, maybe that's something that could could complement the strategy. Uh, Chair, could I, would you mind if I came in at that point? Because it, uh, of course, is, Michelle. Thank you. Sorry, it's difficult with your hand yeah, up, isn't sorry. it? No, not at all. So, so, if we look at the concept of Head Start housing, where the local authority actually allocated a million pounds of capital monies for us to go out and purchase a number of properties for our care leavers, which are coming on board now. In fact, many of them have come on board now. I think. Your, the concept you're describing is absolutely right, and it's, an, it's, it's another strand of potential opportunity with good examples of how we've done that within Head Start. And you're quite right, because then we own the properties, we're getting the income in for the properties, and actually we're giving our young people a, a really good start as we prepare them from transition into um, their own tenancy. So, so that model is there. I think we can build on what we've done there as well as the other things that Catherine's talking about. So apologies, I just thought you'd be interested in that one. Thank you, Misha. That was, that was very good. Um, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report. Can I just ask how many children are leaving out of care between 18 to 24 to go into accommodation that's local? And how many of them that's in the accommodation now that's reached the age of 25 transition into a different ha housing model like um, council housing or private housing that releases it that releases any surplus Catherine do you want to take that yes absolutely um, I, I haven't got the figures with me 
but I can certainly um, circulate those because we um, we we obviously keep track of all of that. Um, I don't know if Michelle knows any and you know anything more, but I I certainly can um, find those figures for you, Councillor, no trouble at all. Okay, thank you. And also, can I just ask one thing in Starbucks housing strategy? Is there any line for children leaving care for this sort of transition for a percentage of void, void properties coming through? Janet, do you want to answer that? Um, I can't comment on the housing strategy and I mean, the percentages, but for our young people who are leaving care, obviously we try and plan for their transition early so that we're kind of clear about what their needs will be. We recognise that they're not all ready for their own property and we don't want to set young people up to fail. Um, but we've got around 286 care leavers aged between 20, sorry, between 18 and 25, 25th birthday. We have a duty to continue to support our care leavers up to 25. I would hope that most care leavers will be ready to be in their own property well before they're 25. Um, so it's, we just kind of recognise that there's a difference for some young people. Some young people are much more ready than others. No, absolutely. I agree with that as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Anderson and then Sally. Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 65, um, it mentions that this uh, piece of work uh, will also contribute to, contribute to the um, uh, following priority um, and it's with regard to the homelessness prevention and rough sleeping strategy, and, and that is to redefine and simplify pathways for vulnerable households to access health and wellbeing services across the borough, especially in relation to mental health. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand on this um, and sort of give an idea of what, what, what this means in practice, because it, it jumps out to me as something really positive um, co contributing to that. Um, but I just wondered if you could expand on that at all. Catherine? Yes, so I, I, that's uh, concerning. Obviously, um, we have a, a number of young people with very complex needs and mental health challenges, and I think it is um, it's a very positive part of the sleeping strategy to look at how we can support people um, uh, who do have that additional complexity. And so we wanted to try and build that in so that we can kind of head it off. Um, you know, so that um, young people aren't faced with homelessness. And so we can actually work really clearly with our care leavers. So it will contribute to that and it will help to reduce any homelessness that um, may come for young people um, kind of later on, because we will be working with them and transitioning, transitioning them, I can speak, into their own properties. Do you want to come back? No. Sally. Okay, so on page 66, it notes that for some of the care leavers, they need to source accommodation outside of the borough. In those cases, who is then responsible for still supporting the care leaver, you know, ensuring that some of them will be vulnerable, that there's those safeguarding checks and elements in place? Will it be the borough that they're placed in or will it still be Farrock's responsibility to look after for those individuals? So uh, when children are in our care and they become care leavers, the responsibility stays with the local authority where they were in care. So if they reach 18, 19, 20, if they want to receive a service, it will, you know, once they get to 21, they can choose not to receive a service. But as long as they want one, it's the local authority who accommodated them in the first place. But in terms of their housing, if they've been living... Um, I don't know, say a young person's been living in Manchester, they've been living there for five, six years, they've got local links, um, they've, they're foster carers, you know, are their family, they're at university or they're working, um, then we would always support them to access housing in that area and the local authority, the housing in that authority has a duty to those young people. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Sorry, Councillor Akinbowen. Thank you. Quick question for Catherine. I'm hearing the word um, building houses, buying some, taking some. It looks like a long, you know, um, long, um, long, long things to do. So I'm thinking, what is the waiting list 
for these young people? How many years do they have to wait for them to get their own place? Um, I'm not sure, Michelle, maybe, or Janet, whether you... you I, I haven't got the information around that. Yes, I can start with the first bit, which is that, yes, if we were going to be building properties and working in partnership with the Housing Association, it would take some time. But actually, it doesn't take quite as long as you think, really. And we've done that a number of times in adult services, which has been quite successful. We've got four or five units of flats that um, are utilised by... Um, people who have learning disabilities and it didn't take too long to establish that but as to how many young people are waiting um i'm, I'm not actually sure of, of that information i'm sorry thank you Catherine. can michelle or janet um i'll take this one um I, in terms of young people who need housing when they leave care we have a joint protocol with our housing with the housing um, department so we're really clear about what their needs are some of our young people stay put so they stay with their foster carers post 18 some will go to university and will be in halls and so what we do is we're planning ahead of time so that children aren't you know getting to 18 and then falling off because we haven't planned for them so the idea being that we know how many young people are turning 18 in the next six months in the next year in the next two years we know which ones are entitled to a care leaving service which ones will need housing you know if we're planning early enough and the independent reviewing officers that work with young people as well as the social workers should have a clear understanding of what kind of housing need they'll have and so if they if they need social housing if they're ready for that and we think they're ready for that then that would be planned quite early and there's a panel where we would sit and talk about with those young people about what is best for them when is the best time for them to move into their accommodation and then something is identified them so we don't for them so we don't tend to have young people who are ready for social needs housing sitting on a waiting list it's just about kind of they might have to wait sometimes you know while we get it right we want to make sure it's right for them um but we we don't have young people waiting for a flat for example thank you because when it up. comes to social housing people tend to be very stressed to get one so do these young people go through all those stress I'm sure they experience a lot of stress. It's a very difficult time for our care leavers. You know, if, um, you know, when my child, you know, reached a certain age, they could come home, you know, if things were really difficult. For some of our care leavers, they don't have that option. So I'm sure it's a very stressful time for them. And that's why we really want to get it right. And we don't want to kind of put them in a position um, where they, they end up homeless. So if we can plan correctly and we can really think about their individual needs, we can kind of hopefully reduce that stress by planning at much earlier at much earlier age having those conversations about what will happen and when and making sure that they're really well informed and any decisions they make are well informed decisions um I, we can't I, you can't completely take away the stress for young people but hopefully we can kind of mitigate that by making sure we're planning well and we're kind of keeping them informed and involved in any decisions for example, if a child is taken out of the borough, if a young people taken out of the borough and find somebody, something for him or her outside the borough, if that person decided after a few years that she wants to come back to, you know, her borough, is there, is it going to be a problem? Ultimately, that care leaver is our responsibility. If they want to come back to Thurrock, then we're happy to have them back in Thurrock and support them to be rehoused in Thurrock. It's just recognising that for some young people, they have made their life wherever they are, they've been living. So if you've been living somewhere since you were 12, to then suddenly be pulled back to Thurrock could be quite difficult. So it's about choice. Councillor Tandy. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it goes to Janet as well. I just need to know the process, if it's easy or not, from, say, someone who's left left the school, needs the property to go in. Obviously, the council's quite pressurised with council houses. Can can a carer can they go into a dwelling or uh, into a private private landlord's property? What's the transition and what do they need? So first of all, it's about establishing where the young person's need, what level their needs are. Right. Um, of course, Michelle's service, um, Head Start Housing. Sometimes young people will go into shared accommodation with other young people as a transition, as lots of young people do around the country. Um, so it just depends on where they are. So. 
if, you know, in terms of their emotional and ability and their physical ability to look after themselves. So if a young person, for example, I don't know, they've reached 18, um, everybody's agreed that they're more than capable of looking after themselves, they've got the independent skills, um, they may stay on at their foster carers whilst um, they've got an application in for housing, or they may go into shared accommodation through Head Start Housing. So there might be um, a sort of a route that they take. It isn't automatic necessarily that they will go straight from foster care into their own flat because lots of young people aren't ready at right. 18 to be in their own flats and manage. And so it's managing young people's expectations as well. Because when I was 18, I'm sure if somebody said they were giving me a flat, I'd be more than happy. But that doesn't mean yeah. I'm ready for it. But the demand for flats and properties is quite high, so what happens then? Well, not all of our young people go into flats. Well, okay. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. They don't all go into flats because they're not all ready for it. Um, but in terms of priority, they are a priority because they're our care leavers and we're their parents. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Um, Catherine, I wonder, can we add to the recommendations on this? That, um, as you say, that you are having discussions about looking at what housing the, the council can purchase uh, and become an in income stream. Could we add this to the recommendations that go forward to Cabinet? Yes, of course. Thank you. The recommendation is, um, so we've got recommendation 1.1, recommendation recommend to Cabinet the commissioning of a framework of supported accommodation providers, including the option to block purchase provisions. So recommendation 1.3, would the members recommend to Cabinet um, the investigation of opportunities to invest in housing from the, for the council to invest in housing um, to help meet the provision that we need that's been identified in the report. Can we move to the recommendations then? Um, can we agree 1.1 and 1.2 as the standing recommendations? Agreed. And 1.3 is a supplementary recommendation. Is there a, agreed? Is there anybody against? No, okay, all agreed. Okay, moving on to item nine, send inspection outcome, written statement of action updates. Michelle, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, since my last report to Overview and Scrutiny, we've had an independent review by the SCND regional um, lead. Um, I've put the key highlights in from the external review. That's enabled me to move some of our, our RAG ratings on because we've used the information from the review and moved some of our RAG uh, ratings on. I think um, I recognise colleagues would have read the report. What I wanted to do was just spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about um, the Parent Care Forum, actually. I absolutely recognise that that was an area that we um, had some challenge around uh, as we were going through our written statement of action. I'm really pleased to report to committee that we've got a newly established Parent Care Forum. I've had a number of uh, conversations uh, with the new chair. Um, she's worked closely um, with her group of parents on um, our SCND uh, strategy refresh. Um, that has now been um, uploaded onto the council system, which I'm really pleased about. But more importantly, actually, she really challenged me in saying, you know what, Michelle, the strategy is absolutely fine. Key priorities, yep, absolutely fine. Um, but we want to see how it's going to be implemented. We want to work with you to see how it's going to be implemented. So we've drafted an implementation plan, which is going through our governance at the moment, of which our Parent Care Forum will hold us to account. So our Parent Care Forum, we will report back to them on a quarterly basis, um, giving an update around where we are uh, with the strategy. And I wanted to bring that tonight, because I'm very well aware that that's something that committee 
have been very interested in making sure that we're engaging with um, parents and carers. I also want to take the opportunity to say that I've had, the I've had some really good um, engagement meetings with our young people. And what's been fascinating, and again, the report later on talks about COVID and the impact of COVID. And I think what's really interesting, uh, a number of young people I've spoken to um, clearly identified that they thought it was quite lonely. The committee will have heard we've got Hangout Up and Running, which is a youth provision which has gone really, really well. But there are a number of young people that said, you know what, actually, it really quite worked for me. It really did work for me. And I think it's important that we recognise that and make sure that we're learning from those experiences. Clearly, as, as things sort of open up more, I'm sure we'll see more of our young people. Um, out. I had to meet them virtually. I'm hoping to meet them in person. But I think there's been an awful lot of engagement work uh, undertaken, and I wanted to report that um, back to committee. I'm pleased to say that, again, I've reported to committee on a number of occasions around the local offer and around work we've done on the local offer, and, and in a sense, functionality, because what parents were telling us was that it wasn't particularly um, user-friendly. We had some feedback. We've um, done a lot of work on that. Again, working with parents and carers. Uh, we're still working on the content. What I've learned about online resources, colleagues, is that you just have to keep looking at it constantly, because things just change constantly, don't they? They really do. Um, just to let you know about um, Ofsted reinspections. Um, so we know that Ofsted have started reinspections. They've recently uh, reinspected um, South End. Um, so we are expecting our reinspection in the autumn term. Uh, we're preparing for that. So, and I think, Chair, I'll probably leave it there because I think I just wanted to bring alive some of the work we've been doing with parents and carers and, and young people. Thank you, Misha, for, for that report. Are there any questions? Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair. No question, just to note, really, um, I think this is the first time um, this uh, uh, actions update has come to committee where um, everything has been either green or, or blue. Um, so just to note that the, there seems to have been really good progress with this and, and just thank yourself, Michelle, and and uh, colleagues for continuing to, to work on this. And it's also uh, great to, to hear about the engagement with the Parent Care Forum. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. I'd just like to echo that, actually. I mean, I think we've only got one amber. There's one amber outstanding. But, I mean, having watched the progress of this, uh, it's really good to see that, that we're nearly there with it. Um, it's fantastic to hear about the Care of Parent um, Forum and the co-production that you're going to do on the implementation plan. You know, I always like to, to know what is the actual impact on the ground. You know, what are our children, our parents, our carers seeing, hearing, feeling that's different because of, because of what, we're, what you're doing. Um, so that is a, that's a really good thing to hear. It's a really good step forward. Um, thank you for that. And also, well, it, I think we have to wait then for the Ofsted reinspection. Thank you. Councillor Watson. Thank you. Um, this is a really great report, and you've done absolutely brilliant on it. Um, can I just have one clarity one, around one thing, and that's on one of your governance. So in 2.2, you've got the SEND Improvement Board, and that's chaired by the Director of Children's Services. But on the actual, this, this, this one here, this governance structure, on the back it says that it's actually chaired by the Portfolio of Education and Health. So can you just clarify who's chairing this, please? So, so that's entirely down to me, I'm afraid. It, it was initially chaired by the Portfolio Holder. Um, for uh, children's services. I think um, once we'd got governance up and running, then the director of children's services took over the, the chairing. So thank you for noticing that, and I'll make sure that's amended. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, because that was um, the bit that I really wanted the answer to, was that the director of children's services chairing it. Thank you. <laughs> She's nodding on the screen, so that's, that's a good thing. Thank you. Well spotted, Councillor Watson. Any, any other questions or comments? Anything you want to say, Sheila? I think we need, I, I do chair that development board. We, we've worked really 
hard as you'd expect us to do. We're very challenging of ourselves. We know that we still have more to do, but we've done a lot and there's been a lot of improvements that have happened. But, you know, we, we're going to continue. And it is great having the parent carer to work with as well, because I've also met with them. They're very enthused about being involved and we want them to be, you know, as you say, properly involved, not just a tick box. So we're really listening to what they have to tell us. Yeah, I'd just like to add, actually, that I had some lovely feedback from um, a parent of um, some SEN children in my ward in Chadwell about the EHCPs, um, said that there's been a real change from them being, now they were centred around the child and they were relevant to the child, they really felt included, um, rather than the previous way of doing them, where it was like you were trying to fit the child into the various boxes. Um, so that was some really, really good feedback, I think, and it, it demonstrates really well the, the work that you've been doing and that that's the kind of impact that it's having for our parents and for our children. So well done. Any other questions? OK, so there's... Recommendation 1.1 1 .1 on page 72 to agree. Agreed. Thank you. Item 10, Thurrocks Educational Landscape. Andrea, are you going to take this one? Yes, thank you, um, Councillor Muldowney. Um, so this was uh, requested because there were quite a, new, a, a few new members to uh, overview and scrutiny so that everybody had a, a, a good picture of, of what education is like in Thurrocks. So, it just sets out really what schools we have, where that there, were, there is a map of where they are um, in the appendices, and there's also um, some links into the report if you look at them online that you can go into further details for any of our APs, where, um, our schools and our special schools. But essentially, we have 55 schools. Um, they are mainly in multi academy trusts, and those multi academy trusts work not just in Thurrock, some of them are national. Some of them are just Essex wide and some of them are Thurrock wide. And then we have some schools that we call um, a standalone academy or an empty mat. Um, but most of our schools are academies all bar one, which is the Grays Convent School, um, which is a Catholic um, high school for girls. In the main, um, we haven't had any change in Inspection Act uh, results for the last two years because of COVID, so inspection activity stopped. Where we were then was of the um, secondary schools that we had, uh, 10 of them had been inspected and seven of them were good. So that made 70%. And of our primary schools, um, we were at 83%, I think, good. Um, and we have a number of schools that haven't yet been inspected because they're new. And they are given a number of years to embed and to get their processes in place before they have their first inspection. So we have a, a number of secondary schools that are new. Um, and we have a, a number of primary schools that have joined a mat and when they join in the mat, they get a new DfE number and that resets them on their roster journey. So again, they'll get time to, um, to have an inspection. So we have a number of schools without an inspection. And um, you'll be aware that we have um, also five colleges. Most of them are, their head offices are based in Essex or South End. So we don't actually get to, um, we don't actually get to claim the results, I'm afraid, because uh, Palmer's and South Essex College, because the head offices are in Essex or in South End, actually we don't get attributed, our children get their results reported in that borough. Um, <clears throat> but the, they are, um, that was part of our journey was to, to move Palmer's to USP to improve that provision. At the same for having SEC in the borough. Um, overall, 87.8% of the schools in Thurrock are graded good by Ofsted. Um, we have um, attainment at uh, early years, key stage one, which is the end of infant school, and key stage two, which is the end of primary school. Attainment is all above, average, above the national average, and progress is sitting at national average. Our secondary schools are slightly just below. The data is just below the national average, but they're improving all of the time, and, and they're closing the gap on the national average. Unfortunately, for the last two academic years, so last year and this year because of COVID, there weren't any um, individual school published results for GCSEs, but I have included in the report 
the um, res results of the bar that the, the um, DfE have produced. Um, and that's taken from the teacher assessments that you would have heard a lot about last year. Um, teacher assessments for this year have all been submitted and we'll get those results in August. So I'll do an update for um, overview and scrutiny in um, probably late autumn on the um, unvalidated results, if, if that would be helpful for you. That would be, that would be great. Thank you, Andrea. Any questions on this report? Sally. Um, obviously, due to COVID, we've had two years of primary school children not sitting in their sacks. So what are you, what plans have you got in place to monitor attainment in regards to Progress 8 for five years' time when those children come out of secondary school because you've not got any entry data apart from teacher-assessed grades? You haven't got any national graded data. So how is that going to be monitored? Because we won't be able to compare ourselves to Essex schools or... Uh, east of England because we've, we're not going to have that baseline to then see how those children in Farrock have progressed from going from year six to year 11. It's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure yet Sally if we've, if we've um, overcome that hurdle. What we do know is every single school in the borough has done their end of term assessments regardless of whether they'll be published or not by the, by the DfE they've done them and that information will go to the secondary school. Um, and then we do know as well secondary schools will score them again against usually a CAT test in the autumn term. Um, what I will say is there's a lot of summer catch-up programmes going on this summer for year six into year seven. So um, I think the majority of our schools have taken up the opportunity to, to use the catch-up funding to run year seven summer schools. Um, they're also linking that in with the holiday and activities, activities and food programme as well. So most of our... Um, Year sixes will have done a lot of catch up during the autumn term and uh, summer and spring of this year when they've been in school. And then they'll do a lot more catch up during the holidays for English, maths and science. And um, the, I don't know yet, nationally it hasn't been said how they will measure the progress of a secondary school. Um, so yeah, that remains to be seen. For us, it will be um, Michelle and I and the other strategic leads meet with all head teachers of all schools once a year, and that's the sorts of questions we'll be asking for next academic year. Thank you. Um, Councillor Akinbari. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, if I hear you correctly, you said something that um, our secondary schools are below national average. For the percentage of children achieving um, eight, eight, well, one to five in their GCSE is slightly below, one or two percent below national average. That was in 2019, which was the last time we had um, validated data. So what are we doing now to progress, at least, to national average? So... Um, the responsibility for ensuring that children meet national averages the schools and then we work with the um, schools and the teaching school hub to identify areas for improvement and then they work with the teaching school hub which is based at Harris Academy um, and the regional schools commissioner will speak to Michelle and Sheila uh, around schools they're concerned about and we will talk to the regional schools commissioner around schools we're concerned about and then they're directed to work with the, with the teaching hub to improve, whether it's on um, English and maths, uh, to make sure that teacher, the quality of teaching is improved, to ensure that the quality of the curriculum is improved. Um, all of the schools are academies, and, and as such, they, their accountability lies with the regional schools commissioner. Yes, yeah, thank so you very much. I think that's a really important point that, that the purpose of this paper really was to um, for members to know that we've that we don't have direct control as a local authority over our schools you know it's from the government so the, the landscape's very different we have still got some statutory duties which are laid out in the paper but um, we don't have direct control as a local authority anymore so that it's very much shifted um, the landscape of education sort of in the area. 
Councillor Watson, I think you are next, and then Thank Sally. You. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your report and for the stats. I love the stats. Um, can I just ask, um, I know that the maths and the academies are really out of our control, but in terms of overseeing and just watching what goes on, I've noticed that we've got like one inadequate and two required improvements. So what is, is there any way that the council can ensure that whatever they're put in place is actually happening for these children in our borough? Um, again, uh, we do. We have what we call the uh, annual conversation. So we will be asking schools that are not yet good. All of those schools that are not yet good, good sit within a strong mat. That's the reason that they're in that mat usually. So we had um, a primary school that went to an adequate a couple of years ago. It went straight into a very strong mat. Michelle and I would have conversations with the CEOs of those of the mat to ensure that leadership is, is strengthened. And, and so we, 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 we reassure ourselves that what they say they're going to do is being done. But it lies, the, the ultimate responsibility lies with the Regional Schools Commissioner. But we make sure that we undertake um, the, the statutory duty of the... Um, the director of children, uh, <coughs> director of children's services, is to promote educational excellence. So that's what we do. We make sure we do that. So I, I totally get that. But if we had grave concerns about a school, have we got no mechanism or no feedback into this commissioner to say we, do. we have got grave concerns we, by the director of children's services because yep. she represents, as you said, the excellence of our borough, of our yep. education, of our children, that are the foundation of us anyway. No, we absolutely do. Michelle has an, a conversation with the Regional Schools Commission very regularly. I meet with the DfE, uh, and Michelle does every, every week at the moment, isn't it? We meet with the DfE and we discuss any concerns. We discuss openly with the DfE and the Regional Schools Commissioner. And they are, uh, they, it's a two-way exchange, isn't it, of information. Thank you. Yes, Michelle. Okay. So just to give you a bit of reassurance, I think the key for us is partnership how we work in partnership and I think that's really important so as Andrea said um, currently I'm having weekly meetings with uh, the regional schools commissioner office in fact we've got our annual conversation with the regional schools commissioner next week so Sheila and I will be meeting uh, with uh, the regional schools commissioner to go through that and it is very much that that exchange really if we are concerned then we can flag it there and, and it works the other way if they come to us and say look we're concerned what's your intelligence telling you I think the other thing for us is that because we've got that strong partnership relationship so if when we come to the next report about things we've done during COVID I think one of the things we did really quickly was get weekly meetings in with all CEOs and what we call our infrastructure chairs so so the chairs of the groups that are standalone academies and that's been um, chaired by the director of children's services both myself and Janet um, attend the director of public health comes and does an overview about where we are in relation to COVID cases so we've really embedded that that partnership working so if we saw something or we felt there was something we have got ways in which we can escalate that but ultimately as we've said it Sheila promotes excellence around education in her role as uh, the director of children's services thank you Sally, did you want to come back? Yep, I just wanted to clarify, when you said about the grade, did you mean 9 to 4, not 1 to 5? Yep, okay, because we don't really want 1s, do we? Um, and then also, obviously, nationally, it's been noted that reading, the reading age of children is a concern, and to pass a GCSE paper at a grade 4 stroke 5, you need at least a reading age of 16. So... Are you monitoring or do you get that data from the schools on what the reading age is of children in secondary schools? Because if they haven't got an adequate reading age, they're never going to pass the GCSE paper to a level where they will get a recognised grade. What we do is obviously we have the Key Stage 2 SATS data, which tells us which children didn't achieve but we haven't the right got reading that, age. Have we? We haven't, but, no. but the schools do have that internal data. So we might, we might not be able to scrutinise it in the same way as it's published data that we could have a look at and we could have a look at the different groups of children. But the schools do, and the school's bread and butter is to make sure that they're moving children on, and that's our conversations with them. Show, you know, show us, we, we have conversations about data with all schools. Um, whether we, 
always drill down into reading ages. No, we don't. But we do talk about progress of groups and which groups look like they're going to achieve their flight path and which groups are not going to achieve. And then what are they doing about those groups that are not going to achieve? Okay, brilliant. And then um, with the SIP, with the school improvement plans, are you involved with the head teachers, especially for the schools that are inadequate and requires improvement? Do you have any input or discussion about the school improvement plan and how they're progressing within that improvement plan? Again, that would happen at the annual conversation, um, and that usually is with the CEO of the trust rather than the individual head teacher. Um, and again, that conversation is had with um, the Regional Schools Commissioner's Office as well. So if we, if we were concerned, and we do ask for a sc school evaluations and school improvement plans when we, are, when we make the um, appointments to, to hold the annual, annual conversations. So we, have, we often are provided with that before we go in. So we've got good intelligence. Um, I just wanted to ask, I know the answer to this because I asked Misha <laughs> and Andrea earlier, but um, just for the purposes of the group, what happens if a school in a mat gets an inadequate report? Can we yeah, ask take it first and if you, you want to supplement, is that all right? Yeah. So uh, initially there would be a, an improvement plan for that that school in that mat. If it didn't improve within timescales, then the Regional Schools Commissioner would, would move it to another mat. We'd look for another mat pr uh, sponsor for it. Um, potentially, usually it, it doesn't happen. It's never happened in Thurrock, but it can happen. Um, while it's in the same mat with its school improvement plan, does it, is it, does it keep its inadequate rating? Yeah. So it would only be if it was moved to another mat. Great. Did you want to say anything else? Well, I think that pretty much explains that. Um, the other thing was um, about the 70% of secondary schools with a currently rated as good and outstanding. Um, that is below the uh, England average and also the East of England average um, of 79.1. That's the East of England and 76.4. As I understand it, although there's not historical data to look at, um, that is a deteriorating picture rather than an improving one. It's actually a static picture, I'm afraid. Um, one is because um, we haven't had any, any inspections and we would expect that to improve, wouldn't we? We know we've got more schools that are good than we than are currently sitting on a, a good um, Ofsted because either they haven't got an Ofsted yet or because they've improved enough to, have, to now be good, but unfortunately they haven't had the inspection. Um, we, we've remained at 70 for about four years. There hasn't been an improving, improvement picture. What do, you, what do you think the factors are for, for that with our secondary schools? Why are we static? Because I think, you know, sort of more than four years ago, we were doing considerably better than that so we've sort of gone down and then remained static we have um some of that is around um the frequency of inspection if i'm honest because they don't come back quickly do they after they've they've got a, a poor judgment um if we look at the secondary schools that aren't yet good one of them didn't get good around some safeguarding paperwork so the results will remain the same. The results remained <coughs> above national, but their safeguarding paperwork was found to be wanting. Uh, the safeguarding practices weren't, but their paperwork was, and they haven't been re-inspected yet. They, we would have expected them to go straight back to good quite quickly. Um, another one, oh, well, th there's two that really are due an inspection and, and should get a good as soon as they get inspected. But because of the, uh, the halt on the inspection regime they haven't been inspected okay well we look forward to seeing results as the inspections start up again in in the autumn are there any more questions no okay oh sorry councillor akin bowen i just want to know if this offset judgment is um open to parents are parents aware of the percentage of the uh whether uh the, They'll be aware because these papers are public. 
and, and they're public every year, aren't they? And we, we report this every year to overview and scrutiny, so they, they can find it there. But individual Ofsted inspections are, are open to parents, and then you can go on a school uh, a site that's by the DFE called Compare Performance, where you can put all the schools in Thurrockin, and it will tell you that information there as well. Thank you. Any If we can move to the recommendation 1.1 to agree on page 113. Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Item 11, impact of COVID-19 on education and children's social care. I think we've slightly started to touch on this. Um, can I ask Janet, Simon or Michelle Lucas to present the report? Shall I? I'll start and then I'll, I'll hand over to Janet. So I've already identified some of the things we've put into place quite quickly uh, when we went into uh, the national lockdown. I have to say, um, you know, I really recognise uh, the, the amount of hard work and that schools put into mobilisation for making sure that there was a strong uh, online offer. I think trying to adapt as quickly as that and working with children and young people to adapt to that. I think, you know, all credit to our schools, actually, for enabling that to happen. As I said before, um, Sheila very quickly um, introduced the weekly meeting for all of our CEOs, uh, which also included our Director of Public Health. I think the thing for me, we've, we've spent a bit of time talking about SEND, haven't we, this evening? And I think, you know, uh, SEND children, um, we... we clearly wanted to make sure because they were allowed to go back into school that was that was the government's decision a number of those children did some didn't um, and that was parents choice parents said we don't want to send them back we'd rather keep them at home which is what happened clearly for me this report is a bit retrospective colleagues so it talks about what happened what i think we need to get to is what does the future look like and at this particular point in time, that's really difficult to, uh, to be able to articulate. Once we get children back to school um, in September, then we should start to see, um, you know, what the impact is. Clearly, we know mental health is going to be a real challenge. We've got a number of children who are really struggling uh, with mental health, uh, really, really struggling. We're looking at what support systems we can put in um, around that. We know that's going to be an ongoing issue for us. Um, our attendance once children did go back was really good, so that's a positive. Um, I particularly like to highlight the work of Olive Academy, which is our alternative provision provider. Um, they did some um, amazing work during that period, you know, made sure they were in touch with all of their young people, made sure they were in touch with the families, did a real wraparound service to make sure that they were supporting some of our most vulnerable um, sort of young people in our um, alternative uh, provision provider. So I think going forward, Chair, I think this will be something I think committee will want um, some, some further reports on as we get more information. Um, I can see that the committee want data. We will try our best to see what we can bring. Um, not always easy, because as I said, we've not got published data um, at the moment. But we remain committed to ensuring that we're supporting our schools, working in partnership to get the very best um, for our children um, and young people. So I think, you know, colleagues would have had a chance to um, read the report, but I think going forward, it's about as, as we move out of the, the current position, what will the autumn bring? We're already here and we're not quite sure what autumn will bring, are we? We don't know um, about variants and goodness knows what else. So I think we just need to keep a real close eye on this and make sure we're working with our schools to ensure that our children and young people um, you know, are accessing the offer. I think Andrea's always already talked about, it's great to see our schools are um, taking up the summer offer. So they are offering things, um, you know, during the, during the summer break. We've also got the holiday activities program, which has gone live. Um, please take the opportunity to look at it. It's it's a it's a really good program. Uh, lots of things on offer. So um, and at that point, I'll probably stop and hand over to you, Janet. Okay. So in terms of children's social care during the COVID uh, pandemic, 
we continued to deliver a core service to our children and young people and their families to make sure they were safe and safeguarded and supported. So we've adapted to ensure the protection and safety for both staff and for our families. And um, our initial response was to develop a guidance around operational procedures during the co co coronavirus outbreak to inform all Thorpe Children's Services about how our working practices would be adapted. So we knew that we needed to understand what the, risk were, the risks were for our young people in the context of the uh, COVID-19 restrictions. So we carried out detailed risk assessments on each and every child that was open to children's social care. And that was fundamental to determining the method and frequency of visits to children. So we needed to understand which children needed face-to-face -face visits. Um, most of the children already had assessments, but we needed to kind of do those assessments in light of the changes. These were all rag rated um, from uh, red, amber and green. If they received a, an amber, if they received a red rag rating, then it meant that a social worker would always visit that child in their family home and see them face to face. And if it was green, then we would maybe decide that we could do a virtual visit and that would be done over Teams or uh, via FaceTime or different methods of doing that. Um, so on page 133, there's a chart which shows how our visits changed over time from remote visits to face-to-face -face visits. So we started at 50% of our visits in April and May last year at the beginning of the pandemic were done um, remotely. And you can see the changing pi picture over time. So by April this year, we were well in the 90s in terms of face-to-face -face visits. Below, um, there are charts which show a, a DfE national wave data which sort of shows where we've been throughout the pandemic. And we've been consistently performing above um, our, our neighbours um, in terms of national, in our eastern neighbours and our statistical neighbours. So we can see that children who were subject to a CP plan, for example, were seen in, in, seen in the last four weeks was regular. We can see it's um, often at 99 to 100%. Um, children who are looked after seen in the last four weeks again sort of in the high percentages. Not all of our looked after children are seen every four weeks. It depends on what their plan is. So if a child is matched with a foster carer and it's a long-term arrangement um, and it, everybody's agreed at their lack review, then they wouldn't be seen every four weeks. So some of those you will see and think, well, why are they not being seen at the same rate? Um, there's been significant changes in respect of the number of office-based staff working here in the Civic. Um, but we've maintained a rota of core staff within the office with strict safety measures in place. Um, there's always been a, a manager in, present in the office on a rota basis to provide support and advice. Um, and practitioners and managers have adapted really well to that. Our, our, our frontline team, our CFAT team, our child and family assessment team, who initially go out and do the visits, are in every week. So there's always a team in, um, in the office on a rota basis. Um, we've continued to have oversight on cases. There's been virtual catch-ups and team meetings. Um, supervision has taken place both virtually and face-to-face. -face. Um, we've continued to offer um, opportunities for, for continuing professional development for staff. Um, we have a weekly, uh, weekly programme and we commission external training where needed. Um, and we've continued to sort of the DCS, so Sheila Murphy, myself, Principal Social Worker, we've continued to facilitate virtual monthly forum meetings with practitioners to receive feedback and discuss any emerging issues. Um, all staff were provided with PPE to make sure that they were as safe as possible. So were foster carers. Um, and there were some changes in terms of guidelines um, by the government in terms of what we could reduce in terms of um, our activity but we chose to kind of remain doing a lot of the things that we didn't have to do on the basis that we wanted to make sure our children got the right service at the right time. So despite there being some amendments, we continued to visit children and make sure they were safe, that their reviews were held in time, um, and that they were offered every opportunity possible. Um, we Obviously, we looked at the implications to the changes and because we didn't know if there was going to be a depletion in workforce. Fortunately, that hasn't been the case. Um, in terms of our fostering service, 
Um, our foster carers, um, like many families, change, face challenges of living together kind of in, a, in these unusual circumstances. But our children were prioritised for school attendance. Um, we've done planning meetings. We've continued with multi-agency meetings. They have been mainly remote. Uh, we did do some hybrid meetings when we were in between kind of the first lockdown and the second one. We tried to support contact wherever we could. Um, so especially for younger children who we know need to have face-to-face -face and physical contacts, we prioritised younger children. And for older children, we moved to uh, remote contact where we thought that was appropriate. Um, so we made sure there was literature that went out to carers and to children. Um, one of the areas that's been impacted on um, through COVID has probably been the court process. We worked closely with our legal team and the courts to ensure that proceedings were progressing for children to, for permanency, but there has been an impact for hearings in terms of children. Um, we've worked closely with our care leavers around education and employment. Um, a lot of our, some of our care leavers were, were on, um, were unable to work due to kind of some of the government guidance. So we've made sure we've accessed the appropriate funds that they can be supported and to make sure that young people were not made homeless and that we were supporting them to kind of stay in their homes. Um, we can see that the, the employment and training figures for care leavers is significantly impacted. Um, and so 45% of the care leavers aged 16 to 21 um, were in part or full-time education and employment or training compared to 62% in the previous year. And we're usually above our neighbours and nationally. So that was disappointing, but expected based on what we were experiencing. So in terms of future planning, um, the past year, as I said, has presented a number of challenges. Um, we've developed a roadmap detailing how the service will evolve in the next six to 12 months. Um, and that's subject to obviously the trajectory of the pandemic and any further national restrictions. Um, we've evaluated the positive impact of the, of the pandemic in terms of different ways of working and, and opportunities that are presented to challenge the way we practice and change. Um, and we've promoted agile working within the service and embraced the philosophy that work is a thing you do rather than a place you go to. And for some of our young people, um, what we find is that actually it isn't necessarily being in a room with somebody sitting next to them, but actually some of our young people interact quite well on, on, a, on a social media platform, so on Teams, on Zoom or whichever it is. Um, so I think this kind of demonstrates there was a high level of activity to ensure that children and young people are safeguarded. I mean, social workers and foster carers and all the professionals working with children and families have worked really hard to make sure that they've continued to provide a good service. Thank you. I mean, I think it's true to say that all of our teachers, all of our social workers, all of our staff uh, have, you know, put in an exceptional amount of work to, to get our children, um, keep them safe and try and educate them, even though obviously education has been massively disrupted for our kids this year. Um, so I thank everybody who's been involved in that. Um, I think for myself, I would have liked to have seen the right roadmap, particularly in relation to recommendation 1.2 about looking at other areas going ahead. I know we've got a little summary of it there and that, that was very nice to hear. Um, but yeah, it, it would have been quite, quite interesting to see the roadmap. Maybe that's something that can come in future because I'm sure we'll have another um, refresh of this report. In terms of education, yes, I acknowledge the difficulties in actually having any data at the moment. I know we've had this discussion and um, the DfE asked us as a local authority not to put any more um, onus on, on any more workload on schools because obviously they had enough on their plates during lockdown. Um, so we are working from a lack of data, although we did also discuss that Ofsted did 900 visits, not, not inspection visits, but visits in September and October. And they did note, note some key things, which certainly chimed with my experience and anecdotal um, evidence that um, from other people. So they found that 
children that have been hit the hardest by school closures and restrictions have been regressing in some basic skills and learning. Some young people who, uh, some young children who were previously potty trained, for example, regressed, especially, particularly if they had parents who weren't able to work flexibly. Older children, and I can definitely attest to this with my son, who hates handwriting anyway, um, uh, have lost some stamina with their reading and writing um, and shown, obviously, signs of mental distress in some cases with eating disorders and self-harm. I hope not too many of our children were, were in that category. Um, and obviously there were some concerns raised for children who were out of sight during this time, during the school closures especially. And we can see, I think, from the next report that, that it was very clear that referrals fell um, during the school, school closures during, uh, due to COVID. Um, and we are expecting numbers to go up again. I think num referrals have come up again, so we are expecting a rebound of referrals um, coming as we open up out of the COVID period. So, yes, it's been a difficult time. And I'd just like to acknowledge, you know, for our children that they've had a really, well, over a year now, of very disrupted learning, not being able to see their friends, a lot of social isolation. Yes, for some children, this, this might not have been too bad. For other children, it was very, very difficult. Um, I'm glad to see that you've worked in lots of different ways to to keep contact and to keep everything going. Um, I think you should be commended for the way that you've responded to the crisis. Um, but yes, I would have liked to see the roadmap. Um, I've got a little bit of a concern about the care leavers who've been in education, employment and training. And I had a question about what is the plan to bring those percentages back up again because they've been quite severely impacted, as, you, as you'd expect during COVID. Thank you. So, so clearly what we're looking to do, I mean, colleagues will be aware of the work of Inspire and the work we're doing to support that. Um, the government initiative Kickstart, in fact, I should have said this earlier when I did the SEND um, update, we've just recruited um, five young people into the local authority who have got um, SEND. Um, needs under the Kickstart programme, which is really positive. I think some of the things that have challenged us with our, our care leavers is actually, in many respects, they've really struggled with what's gone on in relation to, um, you know, COVID and lockdowns and so forth. And I think what we need to do is to uh, work with them around the joy of learning again. It's as simple as that, really. Also looking at what we can do in relation to Kickstart. So we've also got our successful on-track Thurrock programme, which hopefully will give it further opportunities for re-engagement of our young people programme that is developed for 16 to 24-year-olds. Um, um, again, what we're looking to do is to see if we can use some of the programmes that we would normally use, like the Prince's Trust re-engagement programme, to really see if we can re-engage some of these young people back into learning. So um, it is something that we're, we're monitoring very closely. We will be working um, you know, during, during the summer to see about that re-engagement work. Princess Trust Programme will work again um, you know, in September. We'll be recruiting, so hopefully we'll get some young people on that. On Track Thurrock is another programme that they can access, as well as Kickstart. So there's a range of things that we're looking at to see how we can re-engage our care leavers back into education, employment or training. But I think it is a, as a direct result of COVID, as you can see the difference last year, 62%, this year, 44 So you can see the, the real impact COVID's had on that cohort of young people. Thank you, Michelle. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair. Um, something that stood out to me uh, in this report, uh, and it was something you very briefly mentioned, Janet, was um, the, the, for some children, um, family contact has gone virtual. Um, now, I'd imagine that, that for some children that, that could be quite um, emotionally distressing, not being able to, to actually have contact with family. I know you mentioned that you've been prioritising uh, younger children, etc. Um, but as, as 
we shall move forward to, towards the 19th. You, you may not, um, uh, you know, know the, the exact uh, details of, of this yet, but are, are you looking to, to start up um, uh, proper contact for, for uh, older children as well um, uh, after then at all? So for some of our older children, they're having direct contact already. Um, so we started off with babies um, because we thought it's absolutely vital that babies have face-to-face -face contact and have that sort of, you know, that, that physical contact. And then we moved to sibling groups and then we moved to older children. So the majority of children are now having direct face-to-face -face contact with the plan to be to kind of be complete this. So we try to be creative about that, maybe doing that outside in the park. Um, especially as the weather changes, it makes it much easier to sort of do contacts in the community and just finding different ways to do it so that young people can have physical contact with their family members or parents. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and, and, you know, I, th I think I, I understand the council um, have guidelines that they, they have to follow, but I, I think this is just one of those really unfortunate um, circumstances that, that's arisen a a out of all of this, um, you know, to... to have um, con contact with family members if, if the weather allows it, you know, is is, is not sort of um, very stable, is it? And so I understand the the um, restrictions put put on council, but it's good to hear that um, that's that's going to start up. Well, get get back to full capacity if you like soon. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your report and uh, thank you for all the work you've done through the COVID lockdown for everything as well and also for the schools because I know that a lot of the children that didn't go to school that the actual teachers have been going out doing touch points with those families as well so my question about that through the lockdown itself is we've gone through a lot of stuff but we haven't really touched on young carers that have been at home looking after a parent or whatever like at a very young age how have we supported them through the whole of the COVID pandemic, where they haven't been able to have that escape to school or another thing? They've had to stay at home and look after their siblings, whatever. So what packages or did we put in place to actually help them cope through the whole of this pandemic? So we've really prioritised those children that we know about in terms of social care. And so we've continued to receive referrals throughout the pandemic and the schools have been excellent actually because they have done that outreach work and they've gone out and seen families so if they're concerned about any children they've come back and I know that I was meeting I've been meeting regularly with um, the schools and some of the heads to talk about some of the difficulties they were experiencing having those conversations about children who may be struggling who may be not be going to school because it's not being prioritized for them or may not be getting the support they needed so we've, you know, where necessary, we've gone out, we've made sure we've done those visits, we've encouraged parents to get children to school, try to find different creative ways of getting them into school, um, because there have been, you know, there has been that possibility for children to get into school. So we've made it a real priority for those children. Where we can, we've supported um, young people to kind of, with obviously through the scheme around laptops and making sure they were getting those sorts of things. Of course, what we couldn't do was provide lots of activities because that didn't really, you know, the circumstances didn't really kind of um, facilitate that. But we've got a participation and engagement worker. We've found different ways to engage some of our young people. We've had events that have been remote. Um, I think we managed to use the theatre on, on one occasion to kind of work with our young children around Christmas time to, um, to just to kind of get them sort of interacting with each other and doing things. And some of that meant it was online, but it meant that they were able to kind of do something that they could enjoy. So we are trying to do different things, but that is, you know, within the restrictions and make it, that is very difficult. So I can't say we were doing masses of things because it was really hard. So it was just about making sure we knew who were the vulnerable children and making sure they were seen and seen regularly. So I think of it for me, it's about... Um some children are actually carers for older, for their parents. And these and these children have been eight and nine years old of age that are being carers and doing this through the lockdown. So they wouldn't have been prioritised. So 
would there be a way that the children's services would have been in contact to give that child a bit of respite, even if they couldn't go out the home, or getting somebody in to look after that parent to allow that child to have a little bit of respite, maybe on a computer somewhere else in the house? So for children who are in those difficult situations, of course, we'd want to make sure that they could get out. So we, I would hope that those are known, most of those children would be known to us, so they'd have an allocated social worker who should be making sure there's a really clear plan in, in place, that family members are supporting, that we're, in, we're, we're supporting family members to enable to do that, that there, if, there are, if they are in school, that we get them into school, um, that we are kind of having those conversations to make sure that children aren't weren't ending up feeling responsible for the adults in their lives in the same way we would do normally, but obviously not having the additional kind of external activities that we may have had. So social workers have continued to visit those children and for some children they've had more visits than they would normally. Thank you. Um, it's 9.15 and um, I would like to move a motion without notice to suspend council procedure rule 11.1 to allow the meeting to continue beyond the two and a half hour time limit as we've got another item on the agenda after this one just to enable everybody who's indicated to speak on this i think we should be okay to finish um hopefully by quarter to ten thank you uh councillor rackham bowen thank you chair um my first question is, um, as Sheila said, that children are struggling with mental health at the moment. What action are we taking to help them to, you know, uh, get to where we used to be before COVID? That's the first question. The second question is, I don't know whether it's within your jurisdiction that um, how um, your department can advise the school to kind of uh, um, advise young people to take COVID job. I don't know if it's within. Um, so in terms of mental health, um, we have um, made sure that we're kind of aware of those young people. So there's some meetings that are kind of going on regularly to make sure we're discussing those young people. So um, once a week, there's a meeting with our health colleagues to, and our mental health colleagues to make sure we're having those clear conversations about where children are, which children are in receipt of um, support, especially at the tier four end. So those young people who need quite extensive mental health support. We also meet with our colleagues from Youths and our adult mental health services as well, because sometimes, you know, mental, a parent may have mental health, which may be impacting on the emotional well-being of a child as well. So we're having those regular conversations and children are still accessing those services in the same way they would ordinarily. Um, for our looked after children, um, we do, um, we um, look at their mental health and we, our foster carers and schools and social workers will kind of work towards um, looking at what we call strengths and difficulties questionnaires to make sure that we're really clear about what the mental health needs of our children are and we have the social workers will go out and have conversations with children um, they're not therapists um, but we're aware as well that children you know in terms of the youth service and mental health service they may not have what they need directly there and then so the the social workers are the conduit between um, the home and our mental health services making sure that we're having regular conversations with GPs, if necessary, about how children are coping. So just making sure that we're putting the services in place and that children are able to access them, making those referrals, following them up, visiting children, um, and trying to make sure, a bit like with the first question um, that somebody asked, which was around, making sure that children have that respite if they need it and that they're not left in a vulnerable situation that's likely to impact further on their mental health. Um, in terms of COVID jabs, I don't know what the answer is to that. No, no, I don't think that. I, I think there was there's some testing going on, perhaps, but I don't think they yet offered. I think it's Michelle. Do you know? 
no, it's no, it's not offered currently um, to uh, school children. I think you're right. I think there are some testing going on around the country, um, and I think that will be down to um, you know, parents will make that decision uh, for the younger child. Clearly, that's a parent's decision. So, I think um, it, it's not something at this stage the local authority could insist on councillor um, but clearly we'd be working very closely with our director of public health um, and our schools as we wait to see what's um, sort of coming forward in relation to that um, I just wanted to pick up briefly on on the mental health um, challenges because we've brought uh, to committee a number of reports around the school well-being service so we have got our school well-being service who um, offer support to schools around that whole system approach there's also uh, the mental health teams in schools. So a number of our schools have got um, sort of mental health teams, which has been commissioned by our, our colleagues from uh, the CCG. So there is a number of things happening to support children and young people around uh, mental health um, difficulties. We do recognise that's going to be a challenge. We're seeing that coming through the system. However, I think, you know, we've got a number of things in place to ensure that we can offer support um, to our schools who are then supporting our, our children and young people. Thank you, Michelle. Sally, you are next. Oh, OK. Councillor Snell. Thank you, oh, Chair. I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor Snell. I've, uh, OK, Councillor Snell, then we'll come to you, Nicola. My apologies. OK, thank you, thank you Chair. Um, I was about to say one thing, and I might say something. Anyway. I might have a, um, a slightly unique perspective, not unique, but a different perspective on this because um, my, my partner works in a, a SEN school and uh, her daughter works in a mainstream school. Um, the, the SEN school kids were back in school pretty much straight after first lockdown and they have remained okay. They've been fine. They've been quite balanced. Their life has pretty much stayed the same and therefore they've come through it I wouldn't say unscathed entirely, but actually, you know, you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them now and when they were before the, the, the lockdowns all started. Uh, it's a completely different story from the mainstream school, though. Um, the children have come back, and um, we're talking about key stage two children here, and they are um, challenging, to say the least, uh, and it's behaviours that weren't being seen beforehand but are being now. And uh, the schools are now trying to work quite hard as they know this is going to roll out over the next six months or so. Uh, and it's a bit of a struggle, frankly, to, to know what to do uh, with the resources that have been put in place, which, frankly, don't really begin to cover it by and large. So I, I think that's an issue. So I would like to see um, this item come back in about six months or so to see where we are after that length of time and to see what's been put in place to, to combat, which I'm sure will be an increasing level of challenging behaviours from certain schools and certain children. Um, I, I'd just like to, um, I wasn't going to, but on the, the jabs for children. Um, children, um, again, from my perspective, having uh, two people in schools, uh, very few have actually been catching COVID. Um, those that have been tested with, and, and are found to be with COVID are often not ill. Uh, and, I, and I think, frankly, it's a monstrous idea to inject children with drugs for an illness where they are not getting ill particularly with it. Uh, and I think it's a sad day when we're asking children, school-aged children, to take a jab. They don't need to protect older people. We're supposed to be protecting them, not the other way around. And I don't think it's necessary, and I would advise against, if, if it ever came to a committee where that decision needs to be can made, I, can I, ask you I to, should say to, no. To wrap up because that, that this is it's rather out of the rebit of this committee. As it, as it was previously brought up and spoken about, I feel entitled to have a say on it. Thank you, okay. Chair. But I finished anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Nicola. Thank you. What you, the work that you guys have done is exemplary, and you've said you've, yourself you've gone over and above what is necessary. But I think my question is going to be aimed at Sheila. What are you doing to ensure your staff are supported, their emotional well-beings are met, they are, you know, they're exhausted mentally, probably physically. Being a mum myself, having to work to homeschool, working till midnight to get my job done. My children aren't tired, so they're up till 10, 11 o'clock at night. 
I, I was so relieved when the schools went back because I had that bit of respite, but it doesn't sound like you guys have had any. So what are you doing to make sure your staff are, are, are coping adequately with this so then ultimately you can make sure our children are protected? Because, you know, we're hearing all about the children, which absolutely is what's right, but without you guys, there's nothing there. So I, I haven't heard anything about how you guys are doing it. So I just want to sort of change it up a little bit, probably a bit controversial, I'm sorry, but... I worry about you as much as the children. Sheila. It's not controversial at all. We do worry about our staff and making sure that they're being looked after as well through this um, period of time. I mean, one of the things we've been really keen to do is make sure that people do take their annual leave. And that may seem a little bit um, trite, but actually... If people just keep working and working, they don't get any break, they don't get any respite. So we've been really clear about people taking breaks, even if you're working from home, because it can be tempting to think I'm not actually in work because I'm not in a building, but you are still working. You still have the pressures of work. So make sure people take their annual leave. We speak regularly with our staff groups about what would help them and what they need from us. Um, and so we do that all across the service. So from my level across to the assistant directors, down to frontline managers, constantly speaking to people saying, what are the particular pressures? What can we do to support? So we are doing anything and everything that we think our staff need to support. Now, and for some teams and for some social workers, it has been about being able to come and meet as a team, to meet as a group. So although they're doing a lot of agile working and working through teams as, as we are this evening, there's also the opportunity to come and meet as a group to get that support directly from your peers, from your managers. Some of our staff have said that they've felt socially isolated and they want to be in the office. So where they've said that, we've facilitated that to make sure that does happen for those staff that are feeling that they need a little bit more contact than they've had. Um, we have got a, a, a mental health support scheme as well for our staff if they need that. But I, I think that as a service, we've pulled together, they've supported each other and any suggestions staff make about what would help, then we've implemented that for them. Thank you. That's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Thank you. I don't think there are any other questions. So if we can um, move on to the recommendations 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 on page 125 to agree. Thank you. So final, well not the final item, but the final substantive item on the agenda, children's social care performance. Can I ask Janet, because we're, we're running over time nearly now, um, to briefly introduce the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't propose to read out the report to you all, um, as I'm sure you've looked at it already. Um, what I would say is what it does show is the changing picture over the last year um, during COVID, right up until the end of March. So it's the last quarter of 2020-2021. So we can see the referrals and the contacts reducing. We can see the kind of the, if you look on page 145, 3.1, you can see the kind of the changing picture of contacts throughout the year. So you can see the points of lockdown and then you can see as we come out of lockdown, how the numbers change and go back up again. Um, in terms of referrals, it's been the same picture. You can see a changing picture over the year and the rate of referrals and, and the assessments. We've continued to do roughly um, uh, a, a sort of around 390, 350 um, assessments a, a month. And, but what we do know is that um, despite there being a reduction in the number of referrals, we've had quite um, some difficult referrals to deal with throughout the year. So in terms of complexity, I think we think that's, that's been an issue. Um, in terms of the number of children looked after, our numbers have stayed fairly consistent throughout the year. We've had a couple of spikes when we've gone up to around 305, but we've stayed around the 300 mark um, throughout the year. Um, so kind of children coming in, children going out. We saw a reduction in unaccompanied asylum seekers um, coming into the service in the last year. Um, and that's kind of slightly increased over the last month or two. 
In terms of missing episodes, you can see uh, that the missing episodes have reduced in terms of our, our looked after children. And the return home interviews um, have kind of increased. So those young people, we've kind of, that's been uh, commissioned out to into this Inspire Hub, which is part of Michelle's service. And we can see we've seen an increase in the young numbers of young people who've engaged with the RH return home interview service. It's not to say we're quite where we need to be, um, but there's definitely been an increase. Uh, the numbers of children on a CP plan is reduced um, over the year. And in terms of where we are um, against our statistical neighbours, the Thurrock is below our statistical neighbours in terms of the numbers of children on a CP plan and below the England and national, the national average. Um, our child protection reviews are completed within timescales and numbers of children, you can see over the year, numbers of children um, subject starting a, a repeat plan in terms of Thurrock statistical neighbour in England. So we're kind of nearer to the England average than we are to the statistical neighbours. Um, so in terms of our care leaving service, we've had some discussion around that. The numbers of care leavers are rising um, throughout the year. And some of that is to do with the new duties um, around providing a care leaving service. So I think throughout COVID, as young people have um, maybe struggled to get jobs and struggled in terms of their finances through the COVID pandemic, those young people who maybe would not have needed a service between the age of 21 and 25 have probably come forward and said, actually, I'd like a bit of support. And we've encouraged young people to do that because what we don't want is our care leavers to be isolated in the community and struggling and worrying about how they're going to manage. Um, we've spoken a little bit about education, employment and training already. Sorry, I'm whizzing through it. And um, in terms of in touch, we're staying in touch with our young people. Um, so, you know, in the high 90 percent, sort of, sorry, 90 percent plus, we're in touch with our young care leavers. Around 10 percent of our care leavers will choose sometimes not to be in touch with us. Um, and in terms of suitable accommodation, um, our young people are in suitable accommodation around 86 percent. So that hasn't changed significantly from pre previous years. So I think we had 88 percent last year. It's gone down by 2 percent. And unsuitable accommodation can include things like being in prison. So it's not necessarily that they're not somewhere that is safe um, or appropriate for their circumstances, but that doesn't mean it's a, um, con deemed suitable accommodation. In terms of children adopted, um, the numbers of children adopted between January and March this year, four, people, four children have been adopted and six children were uh, placed with adopted placements waiting for the hearings. And we know that there's been delays in terms of court proceedings and timeliness. Um, in terms of permanency, we're still trying to make sure that we find the right placements at the right time to meet young people's needs. Um, and where at all possible, we've tried to make sure that children can remain in their families and that's a priority. So we would always try and enable children to stay within the family or the family network rather than come into foster placement. In terms of children uh, placement distance, um, we want to keep our children close to home. So wherever possible, we try to do that. And we're actively trying to recruit foster carers. Um, you know, not as successful as we'd like to be, but that is something that we've got as a priority for the coming months. And that's a whistle top, whistle stop tour of performance. So, any questions? Thank you, Janet. <laughs> any questions, Councillor Ackenbury? Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is on uh, page one five eight, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit of concern if we can lose about 14 foster carers between 2020 and 2021. Why is that? That's a lot. Um, it's not unusual. Uh, often fostering households are older than, you know, they're kind of usually people who are in empty nesters. So we have quite a lot of foster carers that may be kind of in their 60s and above. Um, so we've had people retire. Uh, we've had people during COVID saying, actually, maybe this isn't for me. We've had people moving. Um, so you would expect to lose some foster carers throughout the year. And of course, if there are any 
um, concerns around their ability to look after a child, then we, we'd also look at deregistering foster carers. So 14 probably isn't a huge amount, and it's probably right sometime for people to decide, this isn't for me. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Tandy. <coughs> right, okay, so the, obviously I'm surprised with that because the fostering household, the council tax are offering free council tax now, aren't they? So it's not increased at all really that much, has it? What, in, terms of, in terms of the number of foster carers yeah. we have. I mean, the balance is trying to recruit more than you lose. We know that we will lose each year. We will lose some foster carers. That's kind of natural. Um, but we've refreshed our recruitment campaign. It takes a while. Um, so the council tax offer came in, I think it started in April, so yeah. beginning of the financial year. It takes a number of weeks to assess and recruit and, you know, sort of a foster carer. It's not something that you can do overnight. Um, we've started going back out into sort of shopping centres and sort of trying to find different ways of recruiting. So, of course, a lot of the avenues were cut off for us during COVID. So some of them, we often do events in community halls, shopping centres, areas where there's quite a heavy footfall. Um, but we've not been able to do that. But we've started increasing on that over the recent probably last month or two. So we're hoping to see a difference in that and using social media and different avenues. Okay, thank you. Yes, I know we saw in the corporate parenting that the, the new strategy for um, recruiting foster carers, and there is quite a big ambition, isn't there, this year um, to recruit more foster carers, Thurrock-based foster carers. So that's good. Okay, so if there are no more questions, um, I'd like to move recommendation 1.1. Good, thank you. So item 13 is the work programme. Can I ask Wendy to go through the work programme? Yes, Chair. Um, there's been a few updates since the agenda was published. So. Um, for October, the Ofsted inspection outcome may come to this meeting. Um, and there's also a uh, child and ad adolescent mental health service procurement outcome. Um, I'm just waiting on officers to confirm what that's actually about and whether it needs to come to this committee. So for you, Chair, I'll, um, we'll discuss that when it comes. Um, and then there's the a report's been added that's update on the validated results that we discussed earlier um, on the thorough education landscape uh, for October, potentially, unless officers um, state otherwise. And the health and wellbeing strategy refresh has been moved from October to December. Um, and then I've just added one more report that Councillor Snell mentioned earlier about update on the impact of COVID-19 to come back in six months, which would, which would look at in February. Thank you. What are we doing around the child poverty strategy refresh? Okay, Chair. Um, so with that, um, I mean, you will have seen emails from... Um, the deputy monitoring officer um, to bring that forward the best way forward would be to bring a report here first and then committee members can decide there whether they would want to make recommendations from that report to decide whether um, it needs a whole separate working group or a more formal task and finish group um, or whether it would just stay within the committee to to assess and make recommendations to keep an eye on it um, to well to um, commission officers to do work on this but first it should come to committee as a report yeah. uh, do we have a timeline on when that might happen maybe Sheila can can speak to that so I think I think the issue is is that there's more than one directorate that would be involved in the um, Child, the child poverty strategy refresh. So if, if what's been asked for is a report um, that comes 
to explain how we might be able to do that or which sections of that report we can get done quickly. We, we could get that for October, but to actually do the refresh, we won't be able to do that by October. No, I understand that. I think my original um, suggestion on that was to have a briefing outside of the committee. Um, so not as part of the formal committee structure about where, where we actually are and what kind of work would be involved to get the refresh done as a starting point. Is, is it possible that that can happen in between now and October's meeting? Maybe we should take that conversation offline and come back. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Thank you. Um, Sorry, did Chair, you need... it's just that there's also briefing notes um, to discuss with committee members. Um, so from the scrutiny review uh, last year, um, members had indicated that they wanted to reduce the amount of two-note reports and the idea is to bring briefing notes um, in between committee meetings so these would be circulated by myself to members and the members can decide from there if they wish for a full report to be brought to committee instead of seeing these two-note reports. Are um, members happy to, uh, to do briefing notes? Okay, anything else to add to the work programme? No. Nicola. It's just quite heavy in October, so you, did you say you're adding two more? I wouldn't want much more than that, because that's going to be a long, old heavy night, if not. I think maybe we might need to look at October's meeting again in between, the, in, in between and see what what we can move and what absolutely has to be there and especially if the child as adolescent report needs to come um, would that is that okay with members thank you everyone that concludes the business of the meeting this evening and i now declare the meeting closed at 21:40 thank you thank you everybody thank you.